to evictions. There's a return on investment to society, but there really is a business cost, a case to be made for not following through on evictions, but finding other ways to keep people stable. As Colleen mentioned, there certainly are some predatory land owners and landlords in the industry in Minnesota who seem not to care about the stability of residents. These owners have high eviction rates and prey upon renters who maybe cannot find safe, decent, affordable housing because of barriers such as previous evictions. The predatory landlords should be scrutinized, yet they should not be seen as the norm for owners. That said, evictions do happen. <clears throat> housing barriers continue of Minnesota's most vulnerable. Facing eviction, emergency assistance is a great tool and it's something that we use quite often or we see our residents use quite often. It is, it takes time. Something that we've talked about at MHFA, MHA is pr prior to becoming a resident, if that resident maybe has some evictions on their record and that's a barrier to housing. How do we get them pre-qualified for emergency assistance so they can come with a letter of guarantee? Because by the time, especially for affordable housing, by the time we go through the process of noticing and you know trying to work with them, they're a month behind. If we find out that they don't have emergency after and they're probably facing eviction. So finding some ways to take a proactive approach to that. Again, as Clean mentioned, points of contact for owners at the county level. Many owners don't know what to do when dealing with a possible eviction that's not rent related. I just need to let you know that we are audio disconnected. So we're gonna have a little we're reconnecting uh, and it might be a little disruptive. Just ignore it, keep going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm almost done. Um, so um, again, dealing with evictions that aren't money related. Uh, I belong to a group called the uh, Hennepin County Community Health Improvement Partnership, and we're really taking a look at the connection between mental health and housing, and really trying to focus on what are those um, barriers to getting into housing, but then maintaining stable housing. So mental health really is a um, real thing that um, is a barrier that once somebody is stably housed, if they go into crisis, Owners like Common Bond and others at MHA that are dealing in the service realm might have that capacity internally to deal with it up to a certain point. Many private landlords and owners don't have that. So we're looking at how do we put together an education package at this Community Health Improvement Partnership to go out to landlords and owners, how to recognize mental health crisis, what to do, um, who to reach out to at the county. So those points of contact could be really important. Just um, continue to find resources for landlords and owners, um, letting people know where they can get assistance and not just for the renter, but for the owners. Where can they get assistance? What are their legal rights and responsibilities? Again, scrutinize the predatory landlords. We need to put some real um, policies and procedures in place for that. But I'll take it one step further and we need to go upstream a little bit more for this, is that people become, uh, when they're having an eviction crisis because of non-payment of rent, because they can't afford their rent. Something happened in their life, a hiccup happened, they had to pay a medical bill, they needed something. Um, and so they're struggling to barely make ends meet, let alone, you know, they might not even be able to make ends meet that they've, once they pay their rent, they've got nothing else. So upstream that, that we need more affordable housing so people don't have to make those choices when they've got hiccups in their life. Thank you. Guardian today, our standard site property management company. Yeah. Single unit management, single family home, townhome condo. Our largest building is 36 units to give you an idea of what we're doing. We're in the seven county metro uh, area and we have something in every city within the seven counties. Um, you are gonna hear me um, repeat much of what my colleagues said here today. Our eviction, the evictions that we have are for non-payment of rent. It is um, once in a while we'll have another issue like
Okay, here we go. Um, so anyway, the emergency assistance process. So again, as my colleague said as well, um, eviction is the very last resort for us. We wanna keep our residents housed. Um, and, and when they're in a high stress situation, the number of items that they need to do, sometimes there's barriers just with us being able to work with the resident because the resident hasn't necessarily signed a release because they didn't know they needed to sign that. We do understand the process, and if the landlord could either have a point of contact or if we could just have more access with the county, we could make that process more streamlined. Again, we understand the process, but we don't always have access. And then some of the other issues that we're seeing that um, when we're doing evictions is mental health. There is definitely not a great resource for us Sometimes, unfortunately, the resource becomes the police department or city services. And again, very uh, high stress situation for the resident. And then dependency issues. It's another place where we'll see non-payment of rent. And then finally, um, when we see residents that maybe have multiple evictions, training that resident. Maybe they have never learned um, from uh, learn some ways to um, better understand how to uh, deal with rent payments and uh, you know, um, job training, things like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, opportunity for to ask course members to ask questions. Maybe not a question, but a recommendation around um, how counties work and how to integrate. Um, I would agree that uh, it, it differs uh, depending on the county of residence. But one very helpful thing, because emergency assistance and financial assistance, public assistance, um, depending on the county of residence, may be uh, separated or coordination may not happen is a simple recommendation as a policy option would be to integrate internal processes uh, with intake so that the resource disbursement uh, through emergency assistance uh, for priority populations that counties already serve, uh, those who are uh, uh, in adult mental health case management, children's case management, potentially already visible to the system because of child protection services, simply get priority access. Um, I don't know uh, how counties have evolved, but I think a clear recommendation from this task force in terms of uh, upstream as an upstream, even at the county level, in terms of integrated intake and assessment and uh, priority access would help private landlords, would help stabilize families and other populations. That would be, uh, that might take some orchestration for certain counties. For example, I know Olmstead is quite far along. But for other counties where that might not have been integrated, I think that would be very helpful. And that would really be just a public administration exercise. But we could make a commitment as the housing stability uh, work group to um, either directing resources to enable that to happen or to asking counties to make recommendations around how that might possibly occur. The other thing that's happened over time because of the um, erosion of state benefits directed towards emergency assistance is that they've become less flexible over time. Um, I think raising the cap on emergency assistance so that it's a little higher uh, would actually help because the real dollar cost of rental assistance over time for those populations have really eroded as a discretionary resources have eroded over time. So the impact of this is that we're seeing it with evictions and poverty is toxic. Um, and if you have an adult with a mental health issue that has a child who is maybe going to school and also experiencing some challenge, this would be a really easy win in terms of a policy recommendation or just an administrative discretion. Let's raise 
the dollar amount and then make sure that there's integration. Um, I have a couple uh, clarifying questions um, for Colleen. Um, uh, and I'll just ask them both and you can answer them both. So the first would be uh, off of the emergency assistance. You said that there's a wide variety of time that it takes between two days and 30 days. I mean, that's enormous. I'm wondering if you know what that is caused by, if it's a population. I mean, if it's that there are bigger caseloads or if it's just inefficiency so that we know kind of where to tackle. And then the second question was related to uh, the um, eviction um, pilot project that you're doing in Ramsey County. Uh, you talked about that you're working on expungement to make it easier uh, to get them off the record. I'm wondering, I had heard some um, information about them not being reported ahead of time so that there isn't the necessity for an expungement. Do you know about that or is that part of the program as well? Thank you. Yeah, so on the first, um, I think it depends who you ask what the reasons are. Uh, I hear very different reasons um, and I, I don't, there's, if you look, you know, where it takes two days and where it takes 28 days, uh, the populations are not dramatically different that would lead you to any reason. I think they have, you know, those two counties have taken different approaches to how flexible they believe their funds and their discretion is. On the second question, so there's a couple elements to it. So um, in terms of the act of getting expungements, that's more, I'd say, uh, well, there's two, okay, two parts. So one, the second judicial district has actually changed its settlement form. So you go into housing court, there are some template housing or template settlement forms that you can, you know, if you, if landlord and tenant decide they're going to settle and then bring that settlement to the judge or referee to have approved, um, that has a set of questions on it. So those questions might be, is there, um, what are you agreeing to an amount that the tenant needs to pay? Does the tenant have to move out or not, right? These sorts of questions with the timeline. Uh, so, but there is never any questions on there about whether an expungement was part of the agreement. And so you'd see people, if you sit in housing court, you see people, um, you, know, you might see a tenant who goes up represented and the, the attorney has asked, you know, is prompted to ask for an expungement. And then the next person who goes up unrepresented will say, oh wait, can I have that too? And the judge will say, well, we've, we've already got this settlement here and it's kind of too late because the process moves so quickly. So now on the form, there's a question about, is an expungement part of this agreement? Do you both parties agree to it? And if so, of course the judge or referee still has to sign off on it, but then it, there's two aspects of it. One, it prompts the question where a tenant unrepresented wouldn't otherwise know to ask many times. But the other big part of it is that it becomes part of that court action. So as long as the, the settlement is then um, complied with. It is, I mean, you still need the affidavit from the landlord saying, yes, they've complied, but it is part of that court action and it is done at, sort of part of that whole court case. Other, otherwise, a tenant has to go back separately and, and open up a new case, right? And file. so that's, um, you're trying to kind of streamline it, make it one of, part of that same case. Separately, we have had conversations about um, the idea of maintaining confidential uh, an, ex or, uh, an eviction filing until it is, you know, uh, determined on its merits. And the, the sort of rationale for that is, you know, there are other examples I know in family court where that is done and the, the rationale is because it has such a detrimental impact on a person's basic needs of housing that there you could make this case for the, the balance between public right to know and a person, you know, pursuit of justice. Um, so the, the, the judicial system has made a recommendation only a year or two ago that that not be pursued. And so that is kind of a standing, um, I think the civil committee uh, made that recommendation. So it would be going counter to that, but it, it's, I think, still worth, uh, it, I think it's an, and it's an interesting thought. And again, I don't take lightly the idea of keeping records confidential, but um, it is, um, it really has a big impact on someone's life when the case still has not even been heard out. A little point about the emergency assistance. I think something that we see, and Jennifer, I think we were talking about this on our um, telephone conversation last week in prep for this, that when a resident is seeking emergency assistance and they're working with the county, oftentimes they might go, and as Jennifer mentioned, they're under a lot of stress. Their housing is in jeopardy. You know, they, they're looking for a place to sleep. 
but for this emergency assistance. And that sometimes they forget a piece of paperwork or they were told to go back and talk to management about X, Y, and Z. That didn't happen, could be transportation barriers, could be you know no phone, whatever that is. So having some flexibility or allow some it allow the, the managers or the, the owners of the properties communicate with emergency assistance when they're when the resident is going in for help that can speed it up you know that would really help I think for it would help the resident in the time of stress and it would really um, you know we would we could react much more quickly if we're being asked for a piece of information Colleen, thanks for your comments on predatory policies or practices. Do you have any feel for sort of how prevalent that is? And then remind us, you talked maybe about a Bill of Rights, what you think the best recommendation would be to try to address that? Because I think that tends to have an effect greater than just the particular individual that we're talking about when there can be this idea in certain parts of the community that it's just simply okay to turn over the property because there is a, a long line. Right. I mean, you can even though your business case, I understand, but if you're inclined, you can just keep your place full anyways. Yeah, I think it's um, incontrovertible that there's also a, a good business case to be made for high turnover if that's your business. I mean, you can clearly make a lot of money by keeping a security deposit and double first month's rent and turn it over quickly. So, um, but I don't think there's been any one's you know public interest to support that business model. Uh, so uh, you're. Sorry, your first question was on predatory and how we might define that. Is what percentage of oh, what market percentage? is that? How prevalent is it? You know, I don't know that I would even whether or not I should should guess. I don't know. I don't know. I think what I can say is I think it's a very small minority of owners who um, who who then but it is a a. a dramatic overrepresentation of them in eviction filings. And we can see that by, you know, City of Minneapolis has done this eviction study and they have their high filers list. And there are there are owners who are filing evictions on over 100% rate, you know, of their number versus their properties per year. Uh, so that seems like an easy target that we should all be able to agree on. And there should be certain um, standards that, I mean, even if you said, I don't know, you can't file more than 50%, right? I mean, that, would still catch a lot of them. I think that's still pretty darn high, but I think we could put some very reasonable heads together and come up with a, here are the different predatory descriptions um, on what we should, the, you know, how we should approach um, thinking about uh, an, an owner's responsibilities and a, and, a, and a tenant's rights on the flip side. I would actually point to MHA's point, um, code of ethics that I think is very strong. I don't know if either of you want to talk about that, but that seems like it says, um, Every, you know, you don't file evictions for no reason. You try to work with people. I mean, it's, I think, actually quite a strong statement. Yeah, and just for a couple of, you know, solutions or ideas for how do, what do you do then once you find a predatory landlord after you put in some sort of definition, is it that you put another tier on a rental license? Um, you know, that they're paying more for their rental license. Um, I think that that's just one easy thing that maybe you could do. Not all, not every city has a, a rental license requirement, but you know, how do you think around the, the structures that are already in place? How do you add to that in order to get at those predatory landlords? Thank you. Uh, Neil, follow up and then we'll go to Neil, are you hogging all of the questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, so both of my questions um, are for Lisa. One of the things that you mentioned um, was the funding pool among, was that among MHA uh, members or is that something that's in the works? Uh, no, it's just an idea of, you know, there, we've got the emergency assistance. Some churches might have other resources, but is there more of a state resource that could be put in place for people if they need to come in paying per month's rent or this letter of guarantee that if they had an eviction and, you know, can they come in and so they can, if, they can't pay rent in October, we know that we can pull that letter of guarantee and help them pay rent that month. So some sort of state pool or larger fund. Okay, so that's helpful. Um, I guess a follow-up question is whether or not you think that that's something that would be, um, like that MHA residents, or not residents, members would be open to considering uh, for their own membership, like as a membership benefit. 
I, I would think so. I think that, you know, MH, MHA does have a pool where um, if there's damage is done, then a landlord, an owner can make a case to have those paid back, which is great. But a lot of times it's not the damages, it's the rent. Mm -hmm. So adjusting that, so there's some way to recapture some rent, you know, in order to lessen the barriers that an eviction on a record has. So you can let somebody in, but also know that there's some sort of stop gap in there mm -hmm. so you can help keep them stably housed. Okay, thank you. And so one last question. Yep. I'm going to hog the question <laughs> <laughs> as Neil Gafal. Um, you mentioned this uh, health improvement program. Yeah. The Hennepin County Health Improvement. Are they partnering with the city of Minneapolis? Um, there are, in that group, there are city, um, I can't say for sh sure if there's city reps. All over, there are county reps across um, all different departments, health Organizations are present, housing organizations are present. So the reason why I'm asking is one of the things that came up maybe three or four work group meetings ago was um, the license, the impact on licensure requirements at the city level um, for police calls for someone who may be experiencing a mental health crisis. Yeah. Um, and the impact that that has on the ability to maintain uh, or be in good standing with your rental license. I just wondered if that connection was being made in those conversations. Yeah, we, that is definitely something that we're talking about as a how do we work with the city in understanding when there is a mental health crisis, that that shouldn't be a negative mark against your rental license. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to let Neil have one more question. No? Okay, Brad. And then we're going to wrap this up because we're a lot of time. So just, <clears throat> just kind of curious. I, I was, I had the, the question. Uh, uh, I have a lot of questions about the predatory piece, but I think we'll just save that. But what if you were going to put like the root causes of of non-payment uh, for most most of the evictions, and so take out the predatory side of things uh, where it's it's that's the cause uh, but if you looked at kind of root causes what would what would you say the top two or three root causes are I'll answer for first um, non-payment of rent and it's some other event happens the car breaks down there's a medical event they can't they simply can't pay the rent and then um, again we're working with them we make payment plans and then not ha so then the primary reason for eviction after that becomes they just don't have access to any funds. Yeah, I was to say, we talk about that so so then again a job change, okay. um, a car breaking down, a medical emergency. And and I would I would just add that um, you know in some areas of the state. You know, 50% of the rental population is is cost burdened, and so when it is bad, unaffordable, it just all it takes is that, right? Yeah, I, I would echo that. I wrote down the affordability, and an event happens. But if you're paying more than 30% of your income, it's just not affordable to you know have health care, have educational, transportation costs, food. Um, so affordability definitely is a key. So it used to be in the state of Minnesota that um, uh, the cash grant, uh, public and cash assistance for families particularly, was much higher. We have not raised that in 30 years as a state. Um, so uh, the cost burden households, especially at the percent of um, income that we're talking about, is really just one event away. And so while there's been recovery in the economy because of the recession, if you really look at um, the bottom 30%, and especially families with children, um, the the safety net we used to have was better with average median income in terms of bringing that up, and we just simply haven't raised that, and so we see some of the um, implications of that. I mean, one recommendation would just be to say, okay, it's just really time for us to raise that cash grant, um, even by an incremental uh, small dollar amount, like say 10 to 15%, would help a number of these families because I, I think we're trying to solve uh, an income-based issue. Uh, the, the reality is all of these uh, dynamics are um, intertwined, uh, especially for 
families. And if, if, and the other pieces that we talk a lot about is uh, the mental health pieces. Um, that would be maybe root cause number two, in addition to some of these other longer term term issues. But a lot of it is just people don't have the cash. I mean, they don't, they're in between jobs or they're working pretty hard to survive. I'm not sure that my number is uh, currently accurate, but I, what, is, what I recall hearing was for a mother with a child on public assistance, it's $457 a month. That's the cash. And so then maybe she qualifies for food stamps or if she probably would qualify for food stamps, so that would be a little bit of a supplement. But with our rental assistance funds being so limited, some will qualify rental assistance, but many won't. And even those that do, they're not getting, they're still paying one third of that 457 toward the rent, and that doesn't allow you much flex for anything else to happen in your life. And they do have work requirements or school requirements. So it's not like it's, um, it's not like we're very generous. And I think it was, 1987, when we last, when that floor was set. So I don't know about the rest of you, but my income's a lot higher than 1987. So uh, that just gives you kind of a context. Is that, I think those are accurate numbers still, right? Okay. So let us thank this panel for your, your presentation. <laughs> Okay, great. So I'm going to invite John to come up, um, John Patterson. We're going to move now to three roundtable discussions, um, mostly because we know that we, we were trying to figure out how to do this in a way that would give us information quickly since we only have one more work group meeting on a, some really critical issues. And we decided the way to do it was to ask our members to engage more deeply in the topics and not not necessarily have a lot more panels, but really move us into um, deeper discussion. So um, uh, we have the three roundtable discussions on displacements, foreclosure and tax forfeiture, home maintenance, and rehab and aging in place. They're all really big topics. So we know we're just gonna hit kind of the, the surface. We only have about 15 minutes on each one. Um, and uh, so we have, uh, Lael and Representative House and Hakun were asked to consider the impacts of displacement through conversion of NOAA units and gentrification. And we thought we would start by asking John to give us just a general quick summary of the landscape for the uh, topic of naturally occurring affordable housing. So welcome, John. Yeah. Thank you. And again, I'm John Patterson, the Director of Planning, Research and Evaluation here at Minnesota Housing and helping coordinate the research for the task force. And I'm gonna just give you a quick overview of a report that we just released last week. And I actually brought copies here that I can hand out for um, the working group members and the, the members of the public. And what we did was we got some data from CoStar, which is a private company which tries to collect data on essentially all the four plus bedroom units in the state. Um, and they do a variety of means of doing it. It's a very comprehensive database and we got um, data on all the sales since 2010 that they had of rental properties, and we got the pre-sale rents and the post-sale rents. And we basically tried to track how many units are lost each year in Minnesota. The data is incomplete, and we did some extrapolation to get some statewide estimates. But the bottom line is we estimate that about, about 2,000 um, units are annually lost each year when a property that is affordable is sold, the owner makes some rehabs, and they increase the units. Um, the concierge in Richfield is sort of the, the, the classic example of that. Um, and uh, some general patterns that there are is that Minneapolis and St. Paul are losing units, but they're usually smaller properties. Um, there's a lot of sales. But in the suburbs, we have um, uh, a lot of sales, but some very, very large properties. And it actually turns out from our estimates, 90% of those lost um, affordable units are actually in the suburbs. Um, and generally, that makes total sense. If you have a naturally occurring affordable housing unit, that without um, subsidies in a higher um, rent neighborhood, it's more likely to be converted to um, sale and rehab and have the rents increased. And actually, if you go to the next slide, um, I think this is the most interesting. Um, this shows on the left those um, where we had good data, pre-sale and post-sale um, data. The red dots show the um, show the uh, the units have been lost, and you can notice there's some very, very large red dots there. Again, sort of Richfield, sort of in the middle, lower 
third, there's a very big dot, that's concierge in Richfield, which was over 600 units. On the right is all of the current naturally occurring affordable housing properties across the state, and the size of the dot represents how big the units are. Um, two patterns that jump out to me immediately is if you look at the southern third of the state, sort of Dakota, southern Hennepin, and Scott, look on the right, there's a lot of little dots. On the left, there's a lot of big red dots. So we basically lost all of the large affordable properties in the southern third of the metro already. There's some larger dots left, but that's one big pattern. If you also look at the map on the blue, where you kind of have a lot of cluster dots, particularly big properties that are naturally occurring. In Hopkins, there's a whole bunch. Um, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, um, parts of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and some of the eastern suburbs. An example would be Hopkins. Um, you have if the southwest corridor goes through, you have light rail going into there, that neighborhood. I'd say that's a, a prime place where you'd be losing some properties. So this put some context on that overall picture. Um, again, we think we're losing about statewide, um, about 2,000 units a year. Putting that into context, we are producing about 2,000 units of affordable housing a year. So we're almost, uh, we're essentially losing what we're adding. So. Um, unfortunately, um, we do not, and that was part of the question, is COSTAR's data is much more limiting greater Minnesota, and we didn't trust the reliability of the data, so we basically figured out a loss rate for the metro area, and we just made the assumption for the 2000 estimate, if the same rate of units are being lost in the metro area, in greater Minnesota as the metro area, you would have the estimated number of units. So I'm wondering if, is David Dunn here? Uh, no. Okay. So David Dunn is the HRA director for Olmsted County, and um, um, he's been here at most meetings. He's on out. David, can you uh, update us on our uh, on our experience in Olmsted so that the group gets accurate numbers instead of what's on my head? So what 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 did our planning department show? We were losing. Your numbers would are, are too conservative, given our experience. So for, for a growing community. So David, would you mind chiming in here? I don't know how. David, we hear little noises, but not your voice. Are you on? I am on, can you hear me? Yes. So what, All right, what is our problem? Are you ready to answer that question? Did you hear the if question? If you repeat the question, I'd be more than happy to answer it real quickly. I'm sorry. I'm multitasking. Aha. Caught. Okay. So um, the question is, what is our planning department showing as the number of affordable housing units that we've been losing as um, that are being that we're being losing in our community and I, I i'm remembering some numbers i'm not sure they're accurate but we've been very concerned about the loss of affordable housing i'm thinking the data that the state agency has um doesn't necessarily reflect our experience we all right i can share a little bit of our experience with that here in olmstead county uh particularly in rochester we haven't we haven't completed this analysis for the rest of the county but that's about 80 percent what we have seen in the last 10 years is we have lost 1,000 affordable single-family homes to uh, rental certificates. So what we're seeing is that as more and more of these properties come on the market, there being two, three, four, or five offers over asking price that are coming from uh, different individuals right away, cash offers, and it's very difficult for somebody looking to buy the home traditionally to compete. And do we have anything on multifamily conversions? We don't have anything on multifamily conversions at this time. Uh, it is an area we're looking at. We've been a little bit more fortunate to date where we haven't seen the explosion yet, but I think it's coming. Thank you. So I, I just would, you know, I think at one point our, our, our planning director said about 100 houses a month in the last year as the destination medical center thing is uh, ramped up. So um, we, are, we are even having our city council starting to talk about limiting the number of rental units you can have in a neighborhood in order to preserve neighborhoods. So all of our most affordable housing is closest in. So I just think that your numbers are, are good, but I think um, probably some communities that are experiencing a lot of growth, probably Fargo-Moorhead, that area is probably also having a similar experience of, of losing um, the affordable units. I do want to have a caveat because I think what um, 
David's finding may not be inconsistent with what we're finding. So this is just properties with four or more rental units. Oh, or you're four just or more, more units. Okay. We don't have the smaller properties. So if you're having single family home rentals, that doesn't capture that. And this is just loss from the sale of a property. So if there's a property owner who's rehabilitating their own property and raising the rent, or just price inflation is raising the rent, not becoming affordable, that's not captured here. This is just the properties are lost from sale um, during the after, before and after sale. Okay, thank you, Akua. So you may have shared this, and I'm um, came in or in the tail end of your presentation. Are these uh, units that are affordable at or below a certain AMI? So we I'll have the report, and I can you can look at that specifically. We use the um, housing choice voucher payment standard as the definition of affordability, and we have a table in the report that shows for every community in the metro area what their payment standard is, and compares that to 46 and 80 percent. 40% and 60% of AMI. And generally, the payment standard is somewhere between 40 and 60% of AMI. So, yes. Thank you, John. Lay on. Want to lead our discussion? Sure. So, um, just a couple of things to think off of what uh, uh, the information that John provided to us. Um, the first is to, uh, I'd like to discuss the, the loss versus the creation, right? Um, we saw with Crossroads and Richfield, um, the 698 units, one sale wiped out all of the affordable units that had been created in Richfield in a year. Um, and, and we're seeing that these sales are more likely to increase in rents and so, uh, that it is clearly a loss. I think the other thing we need to think about too is um, looking at the at risk and what sort of pieces we can put in place to make sure that they're not lost. I mean, the blue dots are gonna be really important for our targeting to say, those are the ones, especially I know that there are a lot in Brooklyn Park. I spoke to some city officials in Brooklyn Park and said, what do you think is at risk here for a potential sale and an, and an upscale or a loss of affordability? And he said, pretty much all of them. He said all of the affordability right now is at risk. And that's because they're older properties, they have deferred maintenance, and um, they're prime for, for purchase. I think we also need to think about it um, in terms of gentrification. So maybe we can also swing into that because more likely these are the ones that are going to be, um, uh, uh, um, uh, we know um, um, from st statistics that People of color, large families, immigrant families are the ones who are more likely going to be um, living in there. So to open it up for discussion, um, I guess I'd like people's input on ideas for the at risk. Like what, what can we be thinking about um, when we're looking at the blue dots and how to prevent them from becoming a red dot? <laughs> Akua? Okay. Yeah, please. Are you facilitating this? I think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I would offer, um, there was a presentation done in the rental um, work group, specifically around NOAA, and some, there wasn't any hard and fast, kind of here's what we're, um, how we're defining what is at risk property, but there were some guardrails that we might consider adopting um, for the purposes of housing stability. Anything, anything uh, specific that you remember? Um, so definitely um, location to transit, um, what are the, the property values around those properties? Um, and I'm blanking now, Mary, does, does anything come to mind? I'm trying to think of um, when we had someone from Greater Minnesota Housing come and talk about this. Nothing off the top of my head, but I know it's captured in the notes and um, I think it could be used. So if I could just jump in, um, our, my analyst who actually did this report, he actually tried to correlate where the losses were to a whole bunch of things. Yeah. The thing it really correlated was the market rents. If you are a NOAA property in a higher rent area, that's where the loss. He looked at change in rents, change in sale prices. He tried a little bit about transit quarters. It's sort of hard to do with this sort of sample size and pull things out, but it was really what jumped out was the communities that seemed to be the most at risk were those with higher rents. Well, so I would just add to that that there was, um, and it's at this point a little dated because it's a, a couple years old now, um, the Central Corridor Founders Collaborative did a study of rents um, and how they've changed as a result mm -hmm. of the construction of the, the Green Line, and so that might be another, um, there's definitely been an uptick in um, rents uh, applied in, in those areas um, along Trans Corridor. And I can see in the map, if you look, I can see there's a three red dots in a line right along the Central Corridor, um, right 
yeah, I think that's right where the central core, those are yep. on the line right there, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike Well, one policy solution might be incentivizing home ownership for certain populations within, I, I think particularly in the Minneapolis, St. Paul, metropolitan areas. Uh, I'm not sure which programs currently exist, but you know, you could actually do underwriting a little bit differently if if a um, if a family or an, the adults in the home are actually gainfully employed, and there could be uh, some uh, partnership with a financial institution that would enable uh, that to occur. So there's there's a um, there are a few examples I think. Um, uh, from across the country, I'd have to like, dig into my memory banks, but for example, uh, people who are uh, immigrants or refugees coming to the country don't have much of a, um, a record in terms of, uh, you know, a FICO score or whatever it might be, but there's a possibility in terms of thinking through how can we incentivize home ownership uh, in these place-based settings, how does that look like, and what would that actually mean? for us to actually have ownership in place because there are uh, populations that want to live in those neighborhoods. And so perhaps there's a different way of uh, figuring that out. I think also in, in regards to the, to the rent and um, that the increase or the higher rent, um, there was a report by MHP recently that, that kind of looked at this. And one of the things that they noted is that you know, rents in the last seven years have increased like 17 or 20 percent. So they're only going to be going up, right? So all of these blue dots, in my opinion, are open for, for prime, for flips, for, you know, for being sold out of affordability, I should say. Diane? John, did I hear you say that it was four units and above that the CoStar data was looking at? Correct. That means there's all the single family homes that we hear the anecdotal tales about for out of state investors swooping in and buying them. And you would expect probably raising those rents as well. So there's that whole sub market or whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah, just to point out that in greater Minnesota, um, it's about 50% of the rental market are in properties with one to four units. We have the four units overlaps, but basically you could say in greater Minnesota, this is missing half of the rental. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brett? So, you know, it's, it's interesting because if, you know, there's one part of not, not trying to get these to flip, um, I'd say, you know, one of the things you learn, don't bet against demographics and markets because uh, you'll lose. Um, and the demographics are if you're a property owner and your property just went way up and it has lots of deferred maintenance, it's probably going to flip. I mean, right. that's the reality. So the question is, can you actually build affordable housing, uh, naturally occurring affordable housing? Can you get the 2000 that we're building to 4000 or 6000 in the private market? Because that's what it's going to take. If, if you think you're going to stop people from, from doing that, I think that's a, that's a hard thing to actually do. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that's one of the questions is how could we actually get the 2000 to go to six. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we, we also were told to look at the NOAA fund as well, right, which is the naturally occurring affordable housing fund that is currently um, uh, in place by Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. They have millions of dollars there to help with the equity to buy these properties. Now, granted, it's limited. And the other thing that I've thought about with that is, you know, that pays for the equity to purchase, but then there's always one of the reasons that these become um, naturally occurring or type C properties is because there sometimes is deferred maintenance. So then what do you do if, some, if you try to get it purchased then with the deferred maintenance? And of course it all comes back to money, but we have to be thinking about both of those pieces, right? You have to think about purchase and you have to keep thinking about the capital costs or the, the, ongoing, the ongoing capital investment. I just wanted to note that at the forum at Golden Valley uh, a little over a week ago, the city of Golden Valley was talking about a program that it has working with landlords of naturally occurring affordable housing and really encouraging them to come to them if they think they want to sell so that they can match them with some of those nonprofit yep. operators. Um, and I think they felt that's been very successful. Of course. Uh, so when uh, I follow up to something that Macau had shared, uh, we had uh, Habitat for Humanity who came 
two work groups ago um, to the home ownership group um, and shared that they have a number of families that, that would satisfy the criteria that you outlined, um, but the, the supply of homes is not available. Mm -hmm. um, and so that goes back to the, the point that Brad raised. Um, the other piece is around um, flexible funding. Um, we also had Sunrise Bank um, talking about some of that, um, something that's come up consistently, I've heard from a number of um, uh, testifiers, particularly renters, is, you know, are there other more flexible ways of looking at um, what constitutes credit? So can you apply a rental history? And I know that um, Commissioner Tingerthal has mentioned that there are some partners that the state is working with that um, has flexible criteria. Um, I think there is an opportunity for this work group to kind of elevate those and in terms of identifying what's working um, and increasing resources for those. Also off of what, I, I know we're kind of jumping around, but I know we are a little limited on time, but um, off of what Michael was saying too about investing in place, right? So allowing people in the community to live in the community. I mean, that kind of speaks to some of the issues of gentrification that we had been talked about is that sometimes when these, are, when these are purchased, then people are displaced out of not only their homes, but also their communities. And there are really kind of two different types. The CURA report that you cited to um, talks about two I mean, there are several different types of gentrification, but kind of two different uh, buckets. The first being financial gentrification, economic, right? So people are priced out. But the other being cultural, where, where they are living in a place and then the, the buildings around them or the businesses around them begin to change to a point where it's not a place where they necessarily want to live anymore or it doesn't, it's not catering to them. So as we think about these things, I think we also have to think about it to keep people in place, but then also that economic investment, the investment in the businesses, the investment in the community, um, larger, larger than just the housing as well, so that it's not, there isn't a cultural gentrification as well. I think we're ready to move on to our next topic. Gail, are you, are you ready? Okay. Are we oh, yeah, 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 go ahead, please. Yes, okay. thank you. I was like, do I have another topic? No, I'm good. <laughs> You don't, but yes. Brad and Neil uh, were preparing to lead us into a review of foreclosure and tax forfeiture. Um, just by way of, of introduction, if you have a question about any of the data, uh, that would be for Brad. <laughs> okay, Brad's, Brad's an economist. He's a, he's a banker and he's just really damn good at it. If you have a question about the summary, or the pictures, <laughs> that, that's for me. That's what I'm better at, okay. Uh, let me just say this, uh, there are a lot of consistencies in the, in the reports that we have here in the data relative to foreclosures, except there's some good news that we haven't maybe seen with respect to some of the rising rates in eviction and other things, which is foreclosures are on the way down. So I think that's a very helpful thing. Um, and secondly, you know, without having the full set of demographic data, you do not see the obvious disparity. It's on your chart number three, if you printed it. The obvious race disparity here at Lael that you um, always are pointing us out to, which is good. It's just, it's not there. Now it could be because the percentage of home ownership overall, right, is lower. So, so it, you know, the, the, chart, the chart just does what it does for us. But um, also though, consistent with what we just heard, you know, relative to the rental market, the two, primary causes for foreclosures are in fact uh, loss of income or reduction in income directly, even before you get into some other significant um, life altering situation. What I was uh, surprised with is the percentage of people that try to get to at least this particular webpage you all pointed us to, some sort of help or assistance counseling well before, you know, almost 37%, well before the, the start, of, the official start, if you will right, of the, the process. And then the last uh, comment I would make, because I don't want to miss our break here in 10 minutes, is um, I was surprised, I just didn't know this, that, um, that the, the normal proceedings do not apply to the trailer houses or manufactured homes, that simply missing a payment on that is like having your car repossessed. And well, it's not really like a car if you're, if you're living in that, if it's your home, you know, and I wonder about that. I wonder about that. I, I will say that the resources overall, um, I tried to click through just about everything I could on the web page, from draft letters to to um, how to stop, how to delay, et cetera, 
are all really fantastic, but, and we talked about that a little bit in the other presentation, but we're still really dealing with the challenge here, which is I can't afford to pay. So I can have a website that provides me all the tools after I'm already upside down on my mortgage, but if what I need is a better ability to pay, I think you bring this up a lot, Sheila, we're, we're, we're dealing with a real challenge here relative to, uh, relative to income and the ability to simply afford um, what it is you're doing. Don't have a, a whole lot to add other than to say, you know, we're at, like Neil said, we're at at a near low, and some of that's this this paradox between if you want to reduce foreclosures, you actually help people get really ready for it, and you don't give them a loan at 40%, even though that's the standard that banks use, 40% of income. And you think of, I mean, most people don't think about this is is that if you have two incomes, you've more than doubled your chances of having a crisis in a family. I mean. So what, what ends up happening, whether it's one is out of work, one gets disabled, one and the, the rate of, of coverage, you know, just basic coverage for those kinds of things, whether it's workers' comp or insurance, is at kind of a low. So, so you have this interesting time where we actually, if you have two incomes that are qualifying for the mortgage, you should actually have even a lower number as a percentage of your income. Um, so part of part of the process is is we're probably at a place because of the of the uh, the conservative banks st stop giving loans we're, we've driven we've driven evictions down or uh, foreclosures down um, but then the question it, it felt like to me it, what Neil said too is is we have to actually look at the disparity issue one and then the second is is how do we actually start to <clears throat> allow more people to get housing, but without putting them at risk. Because the worst thing you can do is get somebody into a house. And I, I think, frankly, the education program that Habitat for Humanity has and others is a really good program. They've consistently kept that, their uh, foreclosure rate at less than 1% across the country in lots of different markets. So getting people ready to actually uh, purchase and sometimes waiting until they purchase till they really have an emergency savings fund and all of that can is actually more important than even the FICO score or any of the other things. So uh, I just think, I think we're at kind of a, this is one of the few, like you said, few pieces of good news <laughs> in all of this. And so how do we, how do we now start ramping it up without causing problem, uh, ramping up home ownership without causing more problems in the future? any conversations from the data you saw and um, Mary I'm sorry if I missed this during the presentation but I wondered um, as you did your work did you run across um, who are the players in the marketplace who are providing the equivalent of foreclosure prevention assistance for renters, because one of the things that, um, you know, we really came together as a state and then to a somewhat lesser extent as a country um, around foreclosure prevention in 2008. And, you know, we organized a lot of resources. We were one of the first states in the country to have a statewide foreclosure prevention um, network of uh, counselors and I apologize for not knowing but I don't have a sense of how what the equivalency is on the rental side I don't believe there is is one I think it's it's left up to the um, to the lender and so part of actually the education you have is there are lenders that actually have that and don't want to actually go through uh, foreclosure and so they actually are there's a lot of lenders that can be very flexible um, there are a lot of just just like we heard in in rental there are predatory people who who are happy to actually um, lend you a lot of money and then and then you know get the house and so I think that's the that's the hard part um, there, it's choosing wisely who you who you borrow from is part of the answer. But I don't I don't believe I didn't find I read through everything I could find last week on this, and and I I think it's just left up to, either to 
to there are so, uh, community groups that do that, but but it, you know I know Wilder does it and others, but it's 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 hit and miss. I don't know if you found anything, Neil, when you read. Not that addresses it specifically, but if you look at, uh, for instance, page five, commissioner shows all the members that contributed to the report. That doesn't mean that they provide sort of a fund, but my guess is those community action partnerships, um, the Lutheran Social Services, the neighborhood associations. Olmstead County Housing Partnership, Habitat for Humanity, all of those organizations are in the business that Brad just described, which is to try to keep people in their houses because they don't want to end up owning all those houses. So maybe different than our conversation about predatory eviction policies, whereby I'll just turn it over in less than 30 days actually and put a new tenant back in. This whole process of trying to get somebody back in the house that I foreclosed on too soon is going to cost me quite a bit more as a lender than just trying to be patient along the way. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so I just wanted to clarify, make sure I understood the question. It was for people who are renting a home that is in foreclosure. It, it prompted a no, just renters in general. So then that's different from emergency assistance. It, I, I guess it's a. It's a mindset thing yeah. that in home ownership, there's a mechanism and there was a substantial amount of federal dollars available as well as local dollars to work with homeowners before they lost their home. And I'm just really wondering if on the rental side of the equation, if there is something emerging that would say, you know, it's it's less expensive for society if we avoid that eviction, just like it's less expensive if we avoid the foreclosure. So that was really my, my question. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any um, resource uh, for people who are renting. I mean, I think there's a tight network of uh, social services organizations, including Wilder, who do that as part of the uh, supportive service. Um, so while there is, uh, we don't try to own the housing. Long time ago we did, and we were a developer, but there are great developers out there now, so we stopped doing that. Um, the support services and the, the uh, case managers or individuals who are working with families um, uh, are doing that type of counseling and support in, in addition to connections to employment, because we know that when we upgrade employment and we give people at least 18 months, I mean, according to the information we have, that's how long it takes to uh, do a permanent increase to your income, getting a certificate through St. Paul College or whatever it might be if your family. Now, this actually presumes that um, the individuals or the adults in that family um, are not struggling with mental health issues, CD issues, have some other chronic health condition, which is often what lands people in poverty, quite honestly. So, I mean, that that's a lead into the next segment, but I, I think that they're, um, the dynamics are also slightly different, but I agree that if there were a recommendation to say, we're gonna get really organized with how we do this, uh, keeping people in housing is way cheaper than turning over a unit. And the reality is there's no uh, centralizing force for doing that, at least that I'm aware of, no. And I think you're right. I think that there was this kind of like, we need to keep people in housing. We're going to have everybody who was one of those financial counselors had a list of other organizations that could serve people who are going through foreclosure or who were at risk. There's nothing like that on the rental side. And maybe that is a great recommendation of a central point and to, you know, have a web of, of community uh, dedicated to that. Oh, I love the fact that we're having some rich conversation among the members, but we are also Neil needs that break. And so um, we need to move on to the home maintenance, rehab, and aging in place. And that is Diane and Michael. We have three handouts that you all should receive. What I'll do is speak to them briefly. And for points that I may gloss over, you can uh, just read them later to uh, pick that up. One of the first things we tried to do is take a very, very brief look at background on need, and at least in the case of very low-income seniors, we have a report that Wilder Research did for Minnesota Housing 
trying to estimate the number of households that would qualify for the agency's rehabilitation loan program, which is an extremely uh, low income repair home program, um, and uh, try to guesstimate how many households there might be statewide that would need that um, assistance. And so there was survey work that Wilder did, and based on that and other analysis, they were able to come up with an estimate of about 16,400 households, 10,000 some in greater Minnesota and six in the metro that would need those changes in their home, whether they're general or accessibility, in the next five years or else they'd have to move. They had almost 18,000 that said they needed some changes, but they could stay there. And if you look at that, that's about 67% of that total cohort in the state's population that would be having those needs. Now the rehab loan program, as I mentioned, has an extremely low income limit and it's adjusted by household. So one of the things that the two of us were thinking is perhaps we could um, work with staff to check on information that would be for households a little bit above it, maybe up to 10,000 or so more um, than those limits, or perhaps like 30% of uh, state median to uh, you know get a better sense. <clears throat> When it came to <clears throat> excuse me, non-senior households, that was pretty much a wing it. So we would see if we could work with staff to pull together some comparable information to have just some benchmark, rough benchmark figures. We were also asked to, all of us were asked to look at resources, financial resources, and in the area of home modifications, there are uh, quite a few, many of them are federal, some are state, and then some are local. And the information sheet that was handed out lists those out. I think one of the important things to highlight there, as well as for the ones in accessibility, are many of the federal ones, probably state too, but many of the federal are at risk. For example, one of the biggest, the Community Development Block Grant Program was zeroed out in the Trump administration budget. So that's one thing that we always have to keep our uh, eyes on. When it comes to home accessibility, one of the key resources there is connected with the Medicaid program, medical assistance, we call it in Minnesota, the home and community-based waivers, and should the federal initiative to attempt to turn the Medicaid program into a state block grant come through, that means that any of that funding likely would uh, would go. So challenges there. One last thing, <clears throat> excuse me, to mention is if anybody wants to explore further accessibility remodeling resources, I did a report for the Statewide Independent Living Council a number of years ago that is on its website, which is the DEED website. And I've cited that in the materials and it covers other topics, but there is a Minnesota specific uh, home mod funding uh, guide there. Repair areas of concern. When it comes to general and energy, just the reminder that uh, we're not just talking about those two, or we are talking about those two, as well as potentially in some cases accessibility. So some households may have one need, they may have two, or they may have all three, and you can just keep in mind whatever the cost implications would be for that. Reminder that many lower income households live in older houses where they may have deferred maintenance or just because of the nature of the property, they may need more frequent repairs. Reminder, as was mentioned before, um, a number of Minnesotans live in true mobile homes and any work on those is very different than the kind of work that you would do in a stick built single family home and products uh, approaches, what have you. They take uh, specialized attention. And as was also mentioned just recently about uh, first time buyers, they may have budget upkeep constraints that we always need to keep in mind. And if it isn't something in the underwriting process, particularly if they may be buying an older home, it's something that should be because that could lead to difficulties if they have a major furnace problem or 
um, electrical problem or something like that, and they have affordability issues with trying to get the work done. Um, when it comes to accessibility, it isn't so much, well, funding is critical, but beyond funding is the fact that many, many people do not realize how highly specialized and technical this is when it comes to owner-occupied properties. Public commercial codes, as indicated <clears throat> in my notes, you'll have to excuse me, <clears throat> it's indicated in my notes, public commercial codes do not apply for homes. What you have to do is tailor the modifications and it requires specialized knowledge and expertise. And unfortunately, this is um, rarely done. There's a, a lack for that knowledge. It's also interesting, and it may sound counterintuitive, but the severity of disability and the extent of access work needed don't necessarily correlate. It depends on the house into which the person with their disability, with their mobility equipment is placed so that it's radically different given the generations of housing style we have in this country for what you may need in various circumstances, from the old four square to the old bungalow, to the uh, split entry, to the uh, split level, to the ranch. Uh, there are, when it comes to rental units, there are significant problems with the single, excuse me, with the um, apartment stock that we have put accessibility features into over about 60 years. <clears throat> location, um, numbers relative to market demand, the features that are in them, there at least is, a, we, we have a far better opportunity or far better ability these days to keep track of those units when they come to market to try to get someone matched up properly with them, someone who needs the units matched up properly because of the services that Housing Link provides. Um, and um, Two very particular demographic groups of concern going forward are the number of single seniors that we have, their needs, and the number of orphan seniors with no living relatives. And one of the areas that may be promising for them as well as others is the notion of uh, golden guy and golden girl home sharing, intergenerational housing. That may be one way to look at issues connected with both access and um, you know, general senior support versus always focusing or considering large unit properties. So we've got a lot of things with existing housing stock, particularly single family homes that could be remodeled to accommodate that. Thank you, Diane. So Diane de deserves all the credit for putting together the handouts. Um, I'll just uh, emphasize a couple of overall themes and maybe uh, lead us into a conversation or any questions that you might have about it. So basically, we're fighting demographics. <laughs> I mean, that's the headline here. And so while people think about um, uh, seniors and uh, people with disabilities as really distinct uh, types, the reality is those two things are coming closer and closer together. and we are uh, spending a lot of money on chronic disease management um, and uh, on formal support systems. We need to look at some uh, ways to actually create policy around uh, supporting informal supports and keeping people aging in place and thinking through new strategies for how we might be able to do that. Um, the uh, intergenerational housing rehabilitation is a method or a way to think about that. The other thing is, uh, you know, you're not, you may be living in a community in rural Minnesota where some of these uh, uh, things aren't necessarily possible. So um, with the multi-generational issues, if you think about how you take care of your parents or the people that you love, you may be very uh, far away from them. Um, and uh, you might not always get there all the time. You know, so what are the supports that we need in a system to keep people in place? Um, aging uh, or having uh, health and safety concerns uh, taken care of? Are there ways that we can think more broadly about the existing resources that we may have through um, uh, the waiver or through uh, existing um, fi financing streams on the service support end? 
Um, we know that for every 1% of um, uh, informal caregiving that we lose in the state of Minnesota, that's costing us about $30 million. That was a figure that we looked at when we were uh, looking at caregiving as a strategy through the Wilder Foundation. We also know that you know, even if you are a single senior or an orphan senior with no living relatives, you may have neighbors and others who can help support you. So there's some work uh, from other nonprofit organizations around this as well as us. We should really take a look at those and see how that relates back to uh, keeping um, seniors aging in place in their homes and or um, uh, spatially in a place where they can have uh, their health and safety concerns met. Um, and then the other, uh, the other, the other theme here is just, and I want to emphasize this is that that there's a growing number of uh, seniors who are homeless. I mean, who are experiencing homelessness. So uh, we we need to have more targeted strategies all over the state of Minnesota. But it, it's something that um, I think, in terms of the topic that was chosen for us, home maintenance and rehabilitation that that's an affordable strategy. I mean, if, if we could, it's easier to actually, uh, even though it may be highly specialized, uh, to look at the existing sources to, to do that versus actually trying to um, create new housing. Now, in some communities, that might be the answer, but it's not always the answer. So any questions that you guys have for Diana and I? Uh, so more um, kind of comments, and part of what I come to as many of these work group meetings as I can is to start to try to make con connections. Um, did you all talk about the share a home program uh, that LSS used to administer? It came up, I asked because it came up at the community solutions mm -hmm. um, group as a, as a potential recommendation. So I just wanted to lift that up. And then one of the um, communities that was identified as a, as a need um, and wouldn't necessarily be served. So I think it, it kind of supports uh, what you all are talking about, about aging in place and um, addressing um, home needs um, is a growing number of seniors with dependents. Um, and so a senior only housing development wouldn't necessarily support their ability to care for their grandchildren, for instance. And so I just want to lift that up as another population for us to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. In some cases, because we've done a, um, a lot of uh, caregiving support and really um, thinking about the whole family, I mean, it might just even be cost if you're uh, a person who is uh, living in the metro area, but you need to actually support someone who's maybe in, I don't know, Itasca County or something. It's just moving costs. I mean, <laughs> you know, there are there are some uh, simpler solutions. Like, and if you think about the solutions that uh, we all want as uh, families to, to be together and to actually rehab particular units. We don't really have uh, pockets of money that are uh, able to support families that want to move into that intergenerational setting. Makes me think mm -hmm. about those families who have an, who qualify for child care assistance and mm -hmm. have a family member that provides it yeah. um, to have some sort of funding source that can pay that family member mm -hmm. to provide that care. Yeah. Maybe a same, yeah. similar application. Mm -hmm. Just thought I'd quickly follow up on your comment about the share home program, and that is in the same general category as the last comment that I had made about um, what I call social living arrangements, where it may be households that are living together and sharing. We actually in Minnesota had a fair amount of that, at least back in the 80s and the 90s. I don't know if we still do, but there was a state-funded program. It actually initially came to Minnesota Housing, and for various reasons, it had house in the name but it really was a social service type program. And so we worked with the Department of Human Services and they were able to take it over and they ran it for a number of years, but I don't know if we still have that, but that is a very a very uh, positive area to explore. I'm wondering if, uh, um, moving more to some potential solutions, if there have been, if you have any recommendations or thoughts about uh, the limitations on accessory housing that many communities have, or the state legislature looked at the granny pods idea where you would have a, um, a, um, a sort of a mobile kind of home that could be, could be located for a period up to six months without requiring um, uh, local zoning approval. I'm trying to remember how this all went. It sort of died quickly. Um, but I'm wondering if you looked at, if you have any thoughts about some recommendations we could make in terms of 
accessory housing or zoning limitations or uh, allowing a temporary housing units or anything like that, if there's any, any dialogue or any discussion about that. Yeah, the <clears throat> what I call social living arrangements covers that. It's things like home sharing, golden guys and golden girls, or an elderly individual and um, a younger person, um, co-housing, it could be accessory dwelling units, which is, it, those can either be in a home, connected to a home, like an addition, or a freestanding unit in the yard. Sometimes it's even garage conversion. And surprisingly, we actually have, at least in the metro, and in some parts of greater Minnesota too, we do have ordinances that permit it. And communities are developing. People may know that Minneapolis now has it citywide. St. Paul is exploring what to do, but you know those are those are all positive possibilities that we should be looking at potentially making a recommendation on. Yep. Just very quickly, a couple of things that task force members may not know that Minnesota Housing does. Um, every year we use uh, appropriated dollars that we get through a fund that we call our challenge fund. And part of those dollars are awarded on a competitive basis for single family homes. And we have several programs that have come in and competed effectively for a number of years. One is Habitat for Humanity with their Brush with Kindness and uh, uh, Rehab program, which they're less known for, but it's, it's really a, a pretty big deal, especially outside of the metro area. More and more of the Habitat chapters are actually um, doing much more work in rehab for existing homeowners than they are building new homes. Um, a second group uh, is called Rebuilding Together, and they um, also work with uh, mostly senior households that um, and provide uh, accessibility as well as other basic repairs to the homes. Uh, a third group is uh, a ramp project uh, that's been going on in Hennepin County for a number of years, um, putting ramps on houses uh, for people who need uh, wheelchair access. The other thing I wanted to comment on is that uh, Diane mentioned our rehabilitation loan program, which has existed at the agency since 1976. Unfortunately, um, every time there's been an appropriation bill in the time I've been here the last seven years, we've proposed an increase in the funding for that program because it, it does serve very low income households. We put the money in as a deferred loan. So when that house sells, um, the money is actually paid back and recycled. And we just have never been able to get political traction for that, for increasing the funding for that program. And um, Minnesota Housing actually uh, uses a substantial amount of uh, our earnings that we allocate to programs um, to increase the size of that program just because it is it is so basic and such low income households and has such an impact on people's lives that uh, we our board has seen that it's an important strategy. So I just wanted you to have some idea that there are a number of funding programs in terms of the physical improvements in this area that have been ongoing for a number of years. I want to jump in to raise one more question, even though we should be um, moving to our break. But in the area of some of these loan programs or some of these zoning policies or task tax forfeiture programs, which we really didn't get into tax forfeiture today. What strikes me is, uh, recently I was talking to Paul Williams about tax forfeiture. He said, oh, we got all sorts of programs in Minneapolis-St. Paul. Well, we don't. Mm -hmm. And we, we thought we were kind of creating something, we, we created a little bit of a tax forfeiture prevention and tax forfeiture tra transfer uh, uh, program in Olmsted County. We had other counties calling us, asking us what our policy was. So I think that there is, there is, I don't know how to describe this, but maybe you, you all want to think about it, is what are the ways that we engage local units of government and our not-for-profits 
community outside of the metro area with some of the successful programs that are working here. You, you have a higher density, you get to the issues sooner than we do, um, and um, it's sort of silly that we are kind of reinventing uh, some things uh, or having to discover it on our own. So if, if, if we're successful as a task force in raising the visibility of housing as a core competitive issue across the state of Minnesota and, and recognizing that uh, communities' um, needs are different and their readiness is different and their flexibility they need is, you know, we need flexibility as well. But it's sort of like we need a, um, a 911 or a 211 for housing. You know, a, a, a place that, that uh, there would be a centralized way of you can get the technical assistance you need, or if I'm the renter with the problem, I know I can call this 211 number and get some assistance, or if I'm a county looking for how to, how to handle a problem. Right now, it's sort of, um, it feels, I know that you can never have a complete resource that meets every need, but it does feel to me like we, uh, we have many debates going on about housing around the state. I think of the, just the ones between our city, our county, our HRA, and my, the little locale where I'm at. And we don't really, we're hiring consultants to come in to give us advice. We're debating the consultants' reports. We don't have a, a sort of a central authority to go to, a central resource. Uh, and if we're going to be, we have a member of our board, for instance, who's always talking about preparing for the change in our demographic toward the aging. But, but he says that over and over again without bringing forward any specific resource because he, we doesn't, he doesn't necessarily know where to go. We don't know how to have that conversation. So thinking about the technical assistance side, the resource side, the uh, models of successful programs, if we could think about how that gets created for Minnesota, I think that would have a ameliorative effect across the state. Diane, mm -hmm. Sheila? Just a quick follow-up that reinforces that. I seem to remember from one of our earlier meetings, and I think it was discussing um, homelessness um, housing models, a fellow from Duluth who talked about he had a particular approach, and somehow he got hooked up with, I think, someone from Olmsted County. And, you know, however they found themselves, that's great. But I immediately was thinking, you know, why can't we be doing this more systematically if it's a, a metro greater Minnesota, or in some cases it may be greater Minnesota to metro. Everybody's got good ideas, but we don't hear about them or we don't know them. I, I think that the idea has a lot of merit in terms of having an integrated knowledge center, technical assistance and capacity building. Um, we've done it, you know, statewide for other types of things that have occurred and maybe it's just time to actually make that a recommendation to happen here. The other thing that um, uh, I think we can look to other states and other models, but uh, there could be a better pipeline directly from organizations that are truly piloting and making a difference uh, to policy. So that would have to be structured. It could certainly be done. Um, and uh, you just have to build it into an institutional body that's existing. Um, and come up with a process for structuring that type of feedback. Um, the challenge with nonprofits, of course, is uh, programs come and go and uh, things change, leaders change. I mean, that's true of government, local government entities too. So the idea would be, you know, how do you create a knowledge center that has consistency and longevity over uh, many administrations and many types of leaders? I think that'd be a good challenge to take on, especially with, with this particular issue and I would embed it in something that's already existing. So our is always provocative and you always want more. Um, you always feel we're not done, we're just on the surface, at least that's how I always feel. Uh, so on the other hand, Neil really needs this break. So um, we're going to take about a 10 minute break and then, and then come back. I think we have enough time for 10 minutes. Or can you do it? If you can do it shorter, that would be great.
I am sleepy and I don't remember what I said, so I hope it sounded all right. <laughs> it sounded great. <clears throat> no, it was, it was fine. Yeah. Uh -huh. Racing to get. Here. Yeah. No, it's a it's it's a program that. Um, I mean, it's it's it makes intuitive sense. It's it's cheaper to rehab and to actually support than to actually wholesale try to create something new. And then the people who live there. Need to have, you know, they need to have, they need to feel like they actually made their life safer and better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, your point about the uh, the knowledge transfer, that's actually something that I had mentioned with the PUA and the gene. For whatever we're going to come out of this whole process with, I think we need a, maybe we don't need another organization, but we need something that is. At least a repository or a, a um, you know a facilitator on a whole bunch of housing issues, and it's almost like something that would be above, not above, you know, outside of many of the agencies, but to take their information and assimilate it and then have it available as a resource. Yeah, it needs to be curated and actually yeah. watched because right. we we do that for Minnesota Compass as we look at right. social exactly. indicators, yeah. and it's. It's, there's a maintenance cost to that yeah. because yeah. people change yeah. over. So I mean, I've been in this role seven years. I think not only have the heads of the the housing, I mean, family housing funds changed mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. I mean, just there's so much yeah. changeover. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm feeling like the elder and I've only been in the role for seven years. <laughs> I can imagine if you've been in the industry yeah. you know, for a long time and yeah. trying to like move, you know, every every. I mean, you do become an expert at things that you you know over time, but mm -hmm. you know, the the uh, environment changes a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so what's possible and what's changed? I mean, that constantly needs to get monitored. So there, you need resources to do that. Yes, yes. But I, I really think, I mean, my feeling is that we have raised visibility and raised people's expectations so much that we can, we're going to have to have something that right. can continue carrying that forward. Uh -huh. It's going to be a hell of a lot of this. <laughs> no, really. Yeah. All the very earnest people who have sent uh -huh. ideas, come to the, oh, the yeah. regional forums, you know, yeah. attend it yeah. here. And besides that, it's a critical issue. You know, all the it's, sorts of ways that we have to right. push. It's a really, I mean, the part that I didn't say, which I wish I'd said during the caregiver thing, is 50% of us are caregiving and working at the same time. Yeah. It's 50% of us. You know, I mean, employed. I'm sitting here and it's running through my head. Yeah. I have been taken care of in, unexpectedly mm -hmm. for six weeks. Yep. My neighbors across the alley, yeah. where the wife has now mm -hmm. unbelievably advancing dementia, as I speak, and she's been running around in the neighborhood and I've been having to chase her. Right. So yeah. I'm going this you know, for that, and then I got another one with the other neighbors, <laughs> so it's like, and this is not even my right, family. But you're, really, yeah, yeah. But, you're, but you're really their caregiver. I mean, and yeah. wouldn't it be nice yeah. to actually have some support? That was actually a report. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, but we're all doing it. I'm doing the same thing. I have four, four elderly people who <laughs> come to my house and garden every yeah. spring. Yeah. <laughs> it's my in laws and that is my, my great aunt and great uncle. So that's yeah. something.
So our break time is over. And call us back together. So if I could get our our lady uh, back together, please. All right, so hope you had a wonderful break. <laughs> um, now we're going to turn this over to Merritt, who's going to lead us through some next phase work on our emerging recommendations. All right, thank you. This is Merritt. And what I'm gonna do, we did a little bit of this last time and I'll show you a little bit more, which is the framing for the task 
Force report. It's really the backdrop for the set of recommendations that's going to come out of the task force um, after being proposed by the three work groups. So we have an overarching vision statement that will be created. We will have kind of a preamble or case statement for the report that talks about you know, why it's important to be addressing housing, why now, what are the opportunities. We have principles, which the task force already discussed previously, but you know, all of this can be revisit, revisited at the very end and confirmed. <clears throat> and then we'll have recommendations, and the recommendations will be organized by some general categories. And then we can have strategies and actions for each recommendation. So that's the overview. And then I'm going to quickly show you a couple things that we have started to work on since the last task force meeting. When staff were really asked to start to create, you know, what does a vision or a preamble look like? Are the elements working? So this is an example of a vision statement. This isn't to say that this will be the statement that the report has or that you guys decide to go with. But a vision statement is just a very overarching, you know, what do we want to see happen with housing in this state? Again, this is just an example of what a statement might be. And staff are going to continue to be working and playing with different ideas for vision statements and bringing that forward um, between meetings for review by members of the work groups and task force that are interested in helping us craft that. We will also then have this sort of longer preamble or case statement. And a number of us, um, we had a staff meeting, we talked about some ideas, and have, we've kind of been playing with this. And um, you don't have to read the whole thing, but I'll show you just kind of how it's framed. There are some larger statements like this. Um, Minnesota's quality of life and economic vitality is built on the foundation of a stable, resilient housing system. It has some words to describe it. Um, and then when I go to the next page, see the topic there in bold, and then with more words describing it, there would then be other sort of bold categories with some words describing it. Um, so for instance, on the second one where we'd say changing housing markets and needs have outpaced our ability to adapt, we might in a preamble or case statement have some background data or graphics that would go with the case statement to just kind of shape people's understanding of where are we at right now in the state in housing um, and what do we need to be doing. So I'll pause there for a minute and say, does that kind of make sense? A very simple vision statement and then there will be a, a preamble or case statement that say two to four pages. And if you understand kind of the process, we'll keep working on it. I think you, you said something about how you're planning to get to the content. How do you plan to get to the content? Well, we're going to continue working as staff drafting across the work groups and general staff and then sharing iterations. We had a uh, call last week with the co-chairs of the different work groups and the task force, and there was really interest in um, being able to touch these drafts as they're evolving by some of the work group and task force members. So I think that will be an open invitation um, that as staff are working through things, um, members of the task force can be participating in the dialogue um, before they show up again at a next task force or work group meeting. And we may sometimes officially send out something saying, We've been working a couple of weeks and we ask everybody on the task force to take five minutes to look at this and comments. So Merritt, would it be appropriate then for members of this work group, even taking this initial, you could consider this an initial iteration. Right. And, and take a look at this and offer by email suggestions, thoughts right away. Yes, I could I can send that out after this meeting. That was sort of our thought is just to introduce it conceptually and then we could send out the first words that we're looking at playing with and start to get feedback. So let me move quickly. Um, you'll remember the task force principles that the task force had kind of conceptually adopted. 
in the beginning, fair and equitable access to safe, quality, stable housing, a range of housing choices, effective partnerships, limited public resources. So we have to focus on figuring out how to prioritize housing stability um, and solutions needing to be flexible. So the principles you can think of as a, a set of ideas that all of the recommendations need to align with and be consistent with. So Mary, yep. uh, I think I've been told that you consider these approved, that these are the six principles you feel with the task force approved them? Well, that had been um, what we'd done at one of the early meetings, but certainly the report belongs to the task force. So I think it's the discretion of the task force to decide if they want to revisit these, especially once you see how the vision and the preamble line up. And if you think that there may be something to shift in the principles that maybe wasn't anticipated. I thought these were good principles for the task force. And I think, and I think we've learned over the last few months, and I would anticipate that um, we may discover that we want more. I mean, I, for one of, one of the things I'd suggest, for instance, I think we've had a lot of conversations about needing to highlight that some, some populations really are disadvantaged when it comes to housing and that a, a principle we might want to have and sort of might be a subset of the fair and equitable access um, is, is really calling on, calling that out in a different way. To me, this first one is so long, you kind of lose really what, your, what our principle is because it has a lot of subjunctive clauses. So that, you know, that, for example, that might be one Okay. And then another one for me is effective partnerships is, is weaker than commitment between public, private, and nonprofit sectors is essential to deal with our housing issue. You know, I started out thinking yeah, effective partnerships, but the more I've been involved in this um, conversation, I'm thinking that one of the things that we can do as a task force is really highlight the fact or call out that the solutions have to be take a commitment from all three sectors so that our, our report is not just directed at, at the gubernatorial candidates and those people running for the legislature, but our report is, is, is focused on getting a commitment from all Minnesotans and a commitment from all sectors to be part of the solutions. Yeah, I think that's good. But for now, we're just looking at format. That right. Okay. How everything kind of fits together. Um, and getting you ready for when you're getting sent drafts and you're kind of like, oh, that's what this is. And I'm going to start offering some input. Last time we met as a task force, we had kind of six, I think six different element, what we we're calling buckets to help organize recommendations. And after the task force meeting and then a staff discussion, we shifted to four that are more general in nature, and those are improve access, increase stability, preserve what we have, and increase supply. Again, this language, kind of how we organize the recommendations into buckets is still open for discussion and refinement, um, but I wanted to make sure you'd seen this kind of shift or simplification. If I could just add a comment on this one, what we found when we went back and looked at the six categories that we ran by you at the task force meeting, we found that they um, still contained a lot of, you know, there was one specifically about home ownership. And we felt that these categories really include the spectrum of housing within them. So. Um, improve access, for example, um, could include information about um, detailed home buyer education as well as improving um, knowledge of tenants uh, about their rights. So these are more kind of a, these are more buckets that will allow us to go across the spectrum. 
I really like this organizing schema because it gets it away from work group language and actually is directed toward, you know, what are we trying to make better? Um, I don't know how this fits into, into the, uh, this is about format and mm -hmm. I think there are two things that we've talked a lot about and they may be uh, uh, two additional things or however you incorporate it. The first is really just investing in what's effective now that we know works. Um, and the second is uh, accelerating and or uh, doing knowledge distribution of new things that, new solutions that really make what we have better or just uh, expanding um, those things. I mean, that's to Sheila's point. So it may be, um, I don't know how it would be incorporated into the framework, but I feel like we keep cycling around those two, those two themes, recognizing that of course we wanna do all of these things, but there are a lot of things that we know actually do work. And so the ones that, that do work, we should simply expand. I'm thinking that um, to tag on to what you just said is we want to be able to accelerate the dissemination of things that are working and we want to be innovative. We have a lot of pride in Minnesota about being innovative and um, what are the innovative, how do we discern and, and test innovative strategies? Brad. The, um, I think these are the outcomes, and it's really hard to write outcomes, because I think these are the four outcomes that we want in general for any of the problems we're trying to solve, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great way to think of, this is what success looks like. But to me, the categories are more like, how do you really deal with low-income people? How, how do you deal with the senior crisis, that's, a housing crisis that's coming? How, how do you deal with predatory, uh, practices across a lot of these. And so to me, there's like, this is what I want to, the recommendation would seem to me about predatory issues with an outcome to do those for one of those four things. And so to me, there's like a, there's a part to it that ha to get to a recommendation, there's like another list <laughs> like the other way across the top to, to really target some of the issues that we hear. Cause what, what I keep, you know, services for, for people who have have extra challenges, or or um, uh, you know where we have we have specific issues around bias or whatever that I mean to me I, I don't know how to handle th that piece that feels more logical to make a recommendation around. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And what we found when we moved to um, four more general elements is you then end up with a set of recommendations that kind of range across things that they're addressing. And that in that case, it might make sense that you sort of have subgroups where you're naming things like you describe, and then you have a number of recommendations for each. So improving access, it could be access specifically to new first time home ownership and you have a set of recommendations. So it may be that there is sort of a an organizing layer that fits between the elements and the recommendations. And then I also want to go back to a comment here earlier um, about thinking of things like opportunity or timeliness. And I, that will be getting to the kind of criteria that the task force will discuss at the next meeting to figure out what is your screen going to be to determine which recommendations you want to see in the report and to prioritize them. So to Brad's comment, I was thinking that in each of these, if we, <clears throat> another way, a subset would be to say, here, here's the opportunities and here are the challenges. So here's, you could, on the opportunities, you could look at what, what's working well already that we need to amplify or what are opportunities that we haven't seized yet. And then where are the, where are the, the gaps? Where are the problems that need to be resolved? Because a lot of our conversations kind of commingle them. We have this, we could do it this way. Someone's doing it well over here, but then there's this other kind of problem. And, and I think, you know, maybe, maybe looking at it that way, uh, what, when you get into the um, sets of recommendations, here's, here's recommendations around opportunities and here's recommendations mm. around uh, uh, where, where we have gaps, what we're trying to fix. And I, I also really loved the David Smith presentation and I keep remembering his um, call on us to do um, 
that a lot of what we were looking at is palliative and not really at root causes. And um, I don't know how to incorporate that in, but I, I think that's, uh, that's a piece. The other thing that he said that I thought was really significant is that it's gonna have to happen at the community level based on community assessment and it's gonna be very granular. And so, so we're, we're trying to do this overarching statewide set of recommendations and we've had a lot of people come to us who see this is a problem and you could fix it if you did this, which is sort of the, it's a granular solution around a problem. Um, and we have, it, it's, it's sort of being able to sort things with that framework would help me. There were hands up over here, so. Yeah, so I just wanted to affirm what I heard you say um, as a kind of one level below is opportunities and, and challenges. And I think it speaks to the, the point that um, Brad raised as well. Um, I think it'll be really important, and this is where you know staff taking the, the lead on this, I think will help um, pull recommendations out of it. it. Will be important to tee up what the, the challenge is or what the problem statement is. And that's where you get to, this is how this particular issue is showing up in these um, respective populations. Um, and so then it's easier easier is relative, right? Um, to then pull out um, and focus the recommendations around the challenges that are yet, um, you know, unmet or the gaps that, that exist. Uh, there was something else that I was gonna say and I've, it's now escaped me, but I'm sure I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like these four. So I wasn't arguing against them. Oh, so just to be really clear, but when, so for example, if you pick predatory that we heard a couple of times today, Actually, you can't put it in any one of those boxes because in order to solve it, you, you want to actually do all four. And some of the things that you would do would solve one of the things around access, but it would, it would, it would eliminate all the stuff that we have and wouldn't create more. Hmm. So, so I think part of those, it's like you want all four outcomes. And so part of it is, is the way, I, I mean, I think these are great, but I think part of it is what you'd have to do is when you look at the challenge is to say, the reality is this is a complex system and you can you can get a result by doing one thing but it will probably hurt one of these other three and so trying to balance all four of those things with the challenge is really going to be a cha I think when we're writing the recommendations is to recognize that it, they don't operate independently <laughs> yes and I don't know if somebody else had a hand up but I remembered my other point um, so one of the things that I think will be important is as we tee up those challenges or we write our problem statements for each of these, um, that we articulate what we've heard in those forms across the state because another piece that came up really loud and clear for me um, in particular um, in, in Little Falls was the desire to not have the recommendations be um, you know, a one size fits all, um, but also understanding that we need to be able to provide something that is actually actionable and helpful. So if we could um, tee up in that problem statement, here's what we've heard and what we've seen in different parts of the state, and then have those recommendations be broad enough that those respective communities, to your point, Sheila, can identify how it works for them um, and incorporate and, and act on them. I think that'll be important. Mary, go ahead. So going, um, Brad, to your thought, um, one of the things the staff group talked about is that it is sort of a matrix approach where these are four elements and then, you know, perhaps there are something like driving factors or something like that it, because I, I, I like the categories that you gave, you know, some of these things that we hear over and over again, predatory behavior, demographic changes, et cetera and that maybe you end up um, you know, putting the different recommendations in the matrix and then maybe they begin to develop into a cluster of almost icons that, that you know, sort of address a certain body of work. So that's another idea that we threw out as a working model, may or may not be the way the report comes out, but it, it, what we're really looking for now are ways to help us think about and prioritize um, all the amazing input that we've gotten and all the amazing work that you've done. So let me just uh, propose a, a, another element, which I don't have, this isn't the right wording, but um, facilitate community-based community solutions. 
not exactly the right word, but we've talked a lot about wanting to to recognize the differences between communities. And I mean, communities could be geographic, but they could be um, neighborhood, they could be cultural. I think that can be a principle, an additional principle. So playing on that theme, I think we've talked at multiple task force meetings about uh, whether the solutions are cross-sector, national, state, or local. And as, as long as you're developing a 3D matrixy, ma matrix model, you, you might as well make it not just 2D, but 3D. <laughs> because I, I like the um, community uh, solution approach, but there are some things that are really important at the state level to take on in terms of policy action. Uh, related to these things. So I think it might help to um, uh, not not just uh, promote very practical solutions at the local level, but identify where the right lever is. Uh, and, you know, sometimes it might be with employers. I mean, I'd include the private sector in that. So I'm just thinking about all the respective roles that we've talked about. I mean, even the caregiving issue, which I said to Diane, I wish I'd said this, is uh, fifty percent of the people who are now working are caregiving for someone uh, that's just a very large employment issue i mean related to uh, housing and affordability and actually just work so we think about it at the um, uh, lower income levels but if you're a senior and you live a long time you are going to spend down all of your resources and you will be one of these individuals that will need support so what do we think about that but i think assigning roles and developing a 3d matrix in terms of the filter might really help I just wanted to second to something that Sheila had said, um, which I'd like to have included as more of a breakdown, and that is the upstream and downstream, because we're going to need pieces on both sides, right? So looking upstream at these bigger solutions, but also, I mean, you had said palliative. Another way of looking at it is just like, what do we need emergency? What do we need now, right now? So making sure that we have that breakout as well, because things need to be done now, but then things need to be done kind of on a bigger, bigger scale too. Duple matrix, <laughs> and we need we need multiple spreadsheets. Um, can we close this part of our discussion now so we can spend a little bit of time looking at the recommendations? You ready? Can we do that? Okay. So um, Jessica and Kathy, are you going to lead us in this next section? We do have five people who would like to speak to us, so we do need time for our public input. So my 45 minute agenda item has turned into possibly seven, maybe more. <laughs> you aren't going to get away with this next month because our whole next meeting will be on priorities, prioritizing these uh, recommendations. So my hope is to walk through them one by one today, but rather than do that, I, I think I'll, I'll summarize them more and really encourage you um, and I'll resend it back out because over the next two weeks, staff is really going to be refining uh, combining a lot of these right now, we have 15 recommendations. I heard another five today that I added to my to the list mentally, um, and I think that's too many for us to even uh, start prioritizing. So we want to get you something more refined. So please send comments, particularly um, on the recommendation and the recommendation language, not so much because I think those will change, but on the actions we've identified because these actions are things that have come from our experts who have come to the meetings, from our call to action, from staff expertise, uh, uh, really a, a lot of folks have come together. One of the things you'll notice on the handout that's in front of you and that we sent out on our recommendations is that we have started identifying who's responsible and what that looks like really are these sectors. Um, don't have the federal sector in as much as state and local jurisdictions, but we're starting to think about who's, who is that level of responsibility and we'll, we'll continue to refine that. So right now as it stands, our recommendations break into four themes really. The first one being increased opportunities to access housing. This is where we really partner with our, our rental group and home ownership group on increasing those opportunities. Uh, breaking down barriers to accessing housing is the next group. Facilitating access to housing is another thematic group. And I'll come back and go through these in, in detail, Merit. And then pro promoting housing stability. 
So in our first area, increasing opportunities to access to housing, we've talked a lot about incentivizing the private sector to participating in, in affordable housing, and that's a pretty broad recommendation. One of our action items that we've drafted so far has been to consider ways that um, a housing tax credit program for employers could be created to create affordable housing for their employees. So that's one potential. Another recommendation is to just increase investment in rental subsidies. And I think we heard a lot about that today. Um, how can we expand the resources that we already have um, creating sustainable programs? The third is to increase the deeply affordable housing stock. And some of the action items associated there are, um, you know, how, again, substantially increasing those resources like the general obligation bond to help facilitate rehabilitation of our publicly owned stock. But really, one of the things we're thinking about are our toolkits for local communities and how can we assist local communities. The fourth one in this general theme are to support efforts for inclusionary zoning. So what one example are to consider legislative changes that allow for more flexibility and clarity regarding the payment of housing impact fees or to allow local localities to create inclusionary zoning for uh, multifamily homes. Uh, in general, can we do that at the state level with something that's been coming up? Okay, so in the next slide are our recommendations that really relate to breaking down barriers to access housing. And the first one in this group, number five, is to develop additional incentives for landlords to rent to tenants with barriers. So we've talked a lot about that landlord risk mitigation fund here, and I think aspects of that came up today as well, like what, how can we have that fund um, help incentivize um, landlords to, to rent um, and mitigate some of that risk. Developing best practices for tenant screening procedures was another area we talked about a lot. We have five action items in this group right now, so some include creating clear and simple legislation for the processes of expunging old or resolved criminal records. We talked about that with evictions today, so we talked about it several weeks, months ago. Uh, for criminal recommendations. Addressing fair housing concerns related to racial disparities or family status. I think one of our key elements here is to really ensure that we're connecting with the analysis of impediments to fair housing reports, both at the metro level and at the state level and, and teasing out some of the action items that are already in those reports that um, make sense for our task force and the work group. The next area, is really around facilitating access to housing. So we talked a lot earlier on on increasing housing related navigation services that are needed to access that housing. We have a whole bunch of action items here. We worked with DHS to develop some, several here, um, including developing or using existing resources to fund rapid rehousing, considering funding housing navigators. And I think a big question is who and how so there aren't really pooled resources for funding na housing navigators, but I think there's consensus that they would be very helpful. The next one is to encourage creative solutions to increase access for housing with, for people with various housing needs and preferences. This is a very um, big title. Um, some of the things we fit under here are to address the regulatory and financial barriers to develop non-standard housing units. And again, that's kind of a theme that's been coming up again and again, our non-standard housing, you know, what are the, the barriers to sharing housing or accessory dwelling units, et cetera. The tenth is to increase housing education efforts and ensure notification and, and access to information. So we talked a lot about developing and making sure a landlord's guide or a tenant's guide is distributed. Um, we've talked about requiring on lease signing, having a, some sort of tenant bill of rights be offered at the time of lease signing, that sort of thing. And then facilitating the implementation of Olmstead, although as and Mike's over here, as we've talked about a lot with the Olmstead Implementation Office, and a lot of the action items in here really cross cut across all of our recommendations. So this might be not a standalone recommendation, but interspersed within um, the rest of lots of, lots of accessibility and availability uh, concerns and recommendations and actions in Olmstead. 
So finally, our group has been talking about promoting housing stability. We've got prevent and mitigate impacts of evictions on tenants. We've talked a lot about that today. Uh, lots of good action items that will that come out of that um, that we that we heard that I'll be adding to the to the list here. Increasing opportunities for seniors to age in place or within the community. We also talked about that a lot today. So we've got some recommendations um, as we discussed today in actions that will that will fit into that category. Supporting universal design standards for newly constructed housing. One of the action items we have example is uh, incent to consider incentivizing through the qualified allocation plans for the low income housing tax credit using having universally designed units in new construction. So this would be both for state and our local uh, tax credit allocators. And then finally, facilitating opportunities for affordable housing initiatives that better integrate with healthcare. We had a big discussion about this. We've got four action items in our group right now, um, including ensuring that the right services and support of housing by building capacity within these supportive housing providers to tap into the healthcare funding streams. And we talked a lot about the Medicaid, Medicaid waiver. Um, that's an action item uh, to continue to support that concept as well. So things that are, are missing from our action items are, um, as I mentioned with the analysis of impediments, are some of the specific state plan action items that we're pulling in. So we'll pull in those specifics from uh, the analysis of impediments. We're pulling in specifics from the heading home plan. Uh, didn't, it's in my, my next draft, but not in what you got in your packet. So I didn't want to uh, talk through that today, but we have several of those plans we've talked about over the last several months that we want to make sure we're not um, competing with in any way. We want to integrate them in, in the best way that we can. So see, seven minutes. So, but we can open it up for discussion. I think we have, we have five speakers. So we've got, we've got some time. This is very exciting. Thank you. Um, I love to see it laid out this way. And I did make note, like, what in particular around the analysis the impediments um, would you be pulling out? So I'm glad that you mentioned that it. it's coming. Um, one of the, there are two things that I think would be helpful to, um, to add to the, the layout. Um, and I think this is across work groups. One is who's impacted. So a specific call out. I think there's, to some extent, it's, it's in this language, but I think we could be even more specific there. Um, so that as we're going back and looking at our recommendations and starting to prioritize, we make sure that we keep um, top of mind those, those communities that we've identified as being important uh, covered. And then the other is where it was heard. So you've got the analysis for impediments in there. There's some other plans that you'll, you'll um, include. But I also think it's important um, for our broader report out to indicate if, it's, you know, if this was a theme that emerged in a particular um, set of uh, forums if it happened in the community solutions, like if it's something that came out of there, I think it's important to kind of show our work. So I could do that. I think that last recommendation is a little dangerous. Um, it, because there were, if you don't end up including something that someone thought's important or you attribute it to some other place, you end up offending people. So I just would be cautious about that. So the, the thing that we captured minutes or um, notes from each of these meetings and they're on the website. I'm not sure if, if articulating that that's where they're coming from. Is My experience is that it doesn't get you, doesn't build your credibility and it actually uh, creates division. Hmm. That's my experience. So I'd be cautious about that. Hmm. Okay. All right. I, I, can I? Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I promised Mike I was not going to get into um, sort of this discussion about how it has to turn out because I'm not particularly um, concerned about that part. I think two things that I'd like to mention at this point. One, I we still really haven't had much of a discussion on who is the intended recipient of this product. Okay, because it changes it, and my fear is. The direction we're moving is going to take us towards a 500 page report that we'll read, our friends in the back will read, and a couple, two other people like all of us will read, and that'll be the end of it. And so this already, without the additions, we discussed the 63 recommendations. 
I mean, we, we broke them down nicely, and it's a great product. I, I'm always hesitant to say anything because I don't want Kathy to think I don't like her staff work, which I have already told her is tremendous. But this is just our group, right? right? And we're going to add some more stuff after we meet next time, times three, times a bunch of other categories. So I would just want us to move to less, not more, more macro and less specific more likely to be implemented and we can put in the appendices appendices sort of the rest of it story can i can i counter that a little bit <laughs> i would have to disagree with you neil i think that it's just the readability of it that's going to be important you know and i think that the way that it's presented because if we don't put in enough detail, then we don't know who's responsible. We don't know the specific actions that we're talking about. So I, while it may not be readable like this, um, if we go too macro, I think it loses some of the weight that we've heard here at the table, that we've heard from people about specifics that they want to see done. And it loses a bit of accountability to who we're asking work to be done from, you know, because it becomes, if it becomes too broad, then some of the, um, some of the actors could say, well, I did that. I just didn't do it in the way that you wanted it done. I did it like this. So I would encourage us to maintain um, the specifics, but your point is well taken that we want people to be able to look at it and access it. So how it's presented, I mean, maybe being broken down in a different way or color coded or something like that may help, but I just don't want us to go too, too general or too broad. So Kathy's going to comment here in a minute, but I'm going to add my own views on this particular topic. I think Neil's question is the absolute essential one. Who is our audience? And we don't always come back to who is our audience. And I would remind us that we're not writing a strategic plan for housing. We're writing a document that's supposed to provide, as I understand it, we're writing a document that's supposed to provide general, broad, aspirational, guidance for housing in Minnesota. And, and so sort of, sort of my worry about, because they will tell you on the flip side, I say, I'm very nervous about this because when we get to specific examples of recommendations, we've only had a few months and we don't have all the things that could be done. So we will be leaving things out and it could be implied that what we're, what we're recommending that we, you know, that they're, that this is the only set of things, examples of what, how we could implement any one of these things. And in fact, we've had a very short period of time. Even though we've had the benefit of some really strongly committed people who work on housing all of the time. Um, so I think, I think there's a danger of getting, of, a, of moving toward looking like we're writing a strategic plan for housing instead of who's the audience. And I think that who's the audience question is critical and the way that I've been interpreting it is that the audience is, is broader. It's not the people that are going to implement housing solutions as much as it is the policymakers uh, and the uh, civic leaders in the, at the state level and at the community level. And we're not really, we're not really trying to, to have the most comprehensive set but we're trying to provide the broader guidelines so that that emerges. That's kind of how. I don't know that those groups are mutually exclusive, though, the policymakers and community, as I, as I heard you articulate them. I'll, I'll be quiet. Okay. Um, I just I don't think it's mutually exclusive, but I think we can be we can we can be in trouble if we get really specific, but we're not inclusive enough in the specificity. And we can get in trouble if we're too general so that there's nothing to hang your hat on. So there's a, but I, I'm more in, I'm lean more toward Neil's assessment. And I'd like you, those of you who work in housing all the time, to recognize that I'm, he and I don't work on housing all the time, but we, we pay attention to it. So those of you who work on housing all the time want to get really, really, really detailed. And we're like, we have to be the bridge builders to this broader conver community conversation to motivate. So, hey, Tom. Uh, I, I agree that defining the audience is uh, 
a key part of actually writing a great report that'll endure across administrations and, and speak to many different sectors. Um, so good luck, Jessica. <laughs> Um, yeah, but in my mind, you know, the, in the best of all worlds, it's, it's a timeless document that identifies clearly the values that we have for a prosperous and vibrant Minnesota. I mean, honestly, that's what it is. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of missing things that I noticed around just the recommendations or things that we've talked a lot about here um, as, it's, as, as it's connected to housing stability. One is, um, is a higher ed pipelines to employment and just um, the income boosters that need to happen as a root cause in terms of addressing either family stability and or uh, uh, felony restoration or putting people back so that they can actually work uh, in the community. So that can be embedded somewhere. There's a really important pathway around uh, certifications and I mean, just, just like getting to a place where uh, people are able to be employed and evictions and or other uh, minor um, things that are following them in the, uh, in the justice system aren't following individuals around. So that, that piece is missing, I feel. And if there's a way to weave that in, that'd be great. So can I, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Lael. Well, I was just gonna say, I, I realize that I work in housing and I am in the weeds. But something along the lines of prevent and mitigate impacts of eviction on tenants, if we just leave it there, I can tell you that there's going to be very little that's done. So maybe it's suggested recommendations, so it doesn't have to be as, as if these are the only things that we would do. But I do think we need to give some, um, so yeah, something concrete, right, that says, what do we mean by prevent and mitigate impacts? And then it also... Um, uh, it validates and it reflects the people who have come to talk to us and the community impact that we have heard. So I get that we don't want to seem like this is all that we're doing and not allowing some space for, uh, for counties or for cities to do their own work. But I also just want to make sure that we don't leave it at a place where it's too broad to have any impact. Uh, I'd like to point out that if we have facilitate implementation of the Olmsted Act, nobody knows what that is except those of you who are keen on it. Right. So if you could make that in English, or, right. you know, a little more understandable. That one's, gonna be first. that one's going. Okay, that one will, will be rewritten. I'm hearing. Okay, Akua, you want to? Yeah. So a few things. Um, one thing that I see missing under um, number H is a specific call out to uh, mitigating or navigating transitions. So we talked about critical transitions from different institutional um, where, whereabouts. Um, so something that speaks to that. So exiting um, prison or foster care or things that we heard pretty um, clearly defined and some, some really solid recommendations provided um, during a previous uh, work group meeting. Uh, the other thing that I would say to, to the point that Neil and, and Sheila raised is is I affirm the, the need to be really clear about um, who our audience is, but would caution the group um, to react to the number of recommendations um, without the process of prioritizing and applying the appropriate filters to the work. Um, as a full task force, you all will uh, <laughs> assure, I'm sure, that all of these don't show up in uh, a final consensus report. And so I would hate for you to prematurely kind of cut off some really um, good and tangible recommendations that will be weeded out in the process of full task force weigh-in to begin with. Um, and so that's the other thing. And the other is as someone who does work in housing um, or did um, more directly, um, I think it's important that it is actually actionable and that we don't um, submit you know, a report that is so high level that it doesn't mean anything because a lot of people are depending on us to do something that is actually like weighty and meaty. And I think that we run the risk um, of, of having just a, just a report um, because it doesn't tell anybody anything and it doesn't reflect all of the really good input that we've had. So to that point, Aku, it seems to me that one of the things we haven't talked about at all is how does the, what's needed to, to move toward implementation and protect, perhaps the staff and, and our co-chairs are looking at that, but a very short six-month window to come up with something uh, 
is not is you know what is the next step where is the level of accountability or what will, what will happen uh, beyond that and then to a tiny specific one on recommendation number four support efforts for inclusionary zoning I think the right language is inclusionary housing because zoning is one option so but it, if you could flesh that out a little bit more too. And I think Mary, I cut you off. Just on your previous point, Sheila, yes, staff has already started um, talking about a communication plan and um, strategies for what happens to disseminate the uh, report once it's completed. You know, how do you actually take the important messages that you will boil this down to and share it with the greater community. So um, we anticipate that we will bring before the task force uh, at both of the next two meetings, so both the fourth and the fifth task force meetings, some information in that regard. But we have uh, definitely been focused on that next chapter. Sheila, real quick before we... Well, we're going to turn to Kathy to sum us up, and then we're going to move to our public session. Well, I just wanted to add very quickly um, <clears throat> the point to this whole conversation around the level of depth here, that I think it is our intention as staff that the hard work that you're doing comes now, where you actually look at all of this and analyze it and help really discern what you think is going to have the greatest impact on the elements, on the outcomes we want to see to the earlier conversation, where do they fit across the matrix that we're talking about. What you see here are possible tools and strategies and actions that we could consider to drive these recommendations forward. So your job really in our final meeting together and then of course as a whole task force is to really analyze that based on the principles and the criteria of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that process, I think Akua, I just wanted to echo your encouragement to not, um, not fret yet <laughs> about the depth of this, but hopefully use this um, to do that kind of analysis going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time left. I'm sorry, we're always a little short. Could I invite the people who will want, wish to give public comment to come up and join us? We'll just move a couple chairs in and a couple speakers over. And I have Kim Lieberman, Linda Soderstrom, maybe that's, maybe I didn't say that one right, Soderstrom, Jean Lee, Terry Hildebrandt and Diane Dubé, and we'll take you in that order. Um, but please just come, come sit at the table. We have one more to add. Okay. All right, and we've added Elizabeth Glidden. Oh, that's that's a name I know how to say. <laughs> So, uh, would Kim Lieberman like to begin, please? Hi, I'm Kim Lieberman. Turn on the mic. Push it. Is that okay? Sorry. Uh, Kim Lieberman. I am with uh, Just Us Health, formerly known as Minnesota AIDS Project. Um, so, I, I've been to a few of these meetings, and I guess I really want to stress that um, while well, the whole spectrum of need is being looked at and has to be considered from home ownership and rentals and middle class and everyone. Um, the needs of people at the most extreme low income is, um, and I heard in today's comments too, you certainly are aware of that, but I just want to re-emphasize that opportunities and access has to be made available to people, whether it's, you know, 30% AMI, if you're looking at, um, I would say the deeply low income, 15% and below even also need housing. So to somehow in your strategies and actions to be sure to make some um, responses to, to that, whether it's people, um, it, you know, I'm sort of uh, working with people that are living with HIV, you have other chronic illnesses and all the all the different um, issues that you've talked of, different barriers, um, different um, issues, situations in their families that they can't necessarily uh, work or get a job or be fully employed um, due to all kinds of things. Um, 
So I just want to urge that you keep in mind that very lowest uh, group of people that have the very highest need in all of your recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Linda Soderstrom. Hi. Um, I hope to learn how to use these mics someday. Um, my name is Linda Soderstrom. I lived at Crossroads at Penn. I helped make the video sold out. I'm forming a Speakers Bureau now. And last week in the apartment dwelling where I am, um, we received uh, news that a new buyer was flipping another 100 units, and we have 30-day notice to leave. So if anybody on their break wants to talk about it some more, I don't really have much else to say, but if you'd like to know kind of firsthand on the ground experiential, I'm here between uh, the sessions. Jean Lee. Yes, Madam Chair, members, thank you. Uh, Reverend Dr. Jean Lee, President Executive Director of CHI, r and Family Centers, and APAC, the Housing Consortium. Um, I'm glad that you touched on uh, some of the issues as far as the foreclosure and tax forfeiture because since 2016, we came across a problem uh, that was going through tax forfeiture, uh, tax forfeiture problem. There was no notice, notification to the seniors uh, that they were in any jeopardy until uh, a sheriff's notice that says your house will be forfeit within so many days. And with that, they came looking around for advocacy and help. Uh, we were the only organization that was willing to help them. LSS wasn't able to help them. SMERLs, um, let's see, uh, Habitat, and so forth. But I'll get into that later. We are still working on trying to get legislation passed that will help fix their problem. Uh, we had opposition from the Department of Revenue saying it wasn't important, from legislators that said it wasn't important. Since then, I testified that we had the death of one senior who lost their house through tax forfeit and one who had a stroke. Uh, they had to go through um, what they call the confession of judgment process in order to save their home. These are seniors that had qualified for the senior tax deferral program but because of problems that are systemic within the county system, within the uh, abstracts, uh, even in the court systems, they were not able to meet the deadline. So all we were asking for was an extension of the deadline so that they don't make a determination to, to uh, kick them out of the program uh, where they had no help available. Commissioner Malcolm is able to tell you that seniors can die from depression, from grief and loss, and from trauma. The Department of Revenue was unwilling to accept responsibility for it, which I understand, so they don't want me talking about you know, these particular cases, but the point is they could have done something to help, and we need the help of other larger entities to make the types of policy changes that can be made um, because you have a larger voice and more influential voice making some of these changes that are needed. So we still don't have that policy in place uh, and we're still hoping that will happen. Um, under this confession of judgment, the property can still be forfeit at any time. So they've got this big boom hanging over their head. Uh, we're currently in court helping them trying to avoid being jailed. Why? because under the statute at 282, there's provisions that allow um, anybody's home, if it's not in proper repair, or if there's any problems that a code enforcement officer can find with the problem, and some of them can be very uh, frivolous, um, they can cite you and um, get you, cite you for penalties, uh, misdemeanor, and jail time. So right now there's a public defender trying to defend this person, saying they shouldn't go to jail. And this, this was for an insurable loss the insurance company wouldn't pay for. They don't qualify for MFHA fix up funds because um, the recorder messed up with the title and so did the abstract. And they don't qualify for Habitat for Humanity, um, Russia Kindness, because 
they don't have funds to do that type of work that they're talking about. So, uh, and, and the systems in the court. So what we're saying is there's all these different systems that you folks can influence. He knew what the problem was um, and can make some of the corrections. We also have uh, one last thing. The, um, some of the, the cities uh, are still looking at honoring what they call covenants made before. And if you search the abstract, you'll find some of them where it says only sell to whites. Uh, so we have some problems with harassment and discrimination, eviction of homeowners or people trying to evict homeowners using any little trick they can because of this covenant that says our neighborhood should only be white. So we ask that you look at some of these systemic problems uh, that can be fixed by these different systems, including the court systems. Um, thank you. Carrie Hildebrandt. Carrie. Hildebrandt. Diane Dubé, is that how you pronounce your name, Diane? <laughs> there it is. Um, I work with um, Alliance Housing that, that um, houses the, the lowest income people, people who are homeless and facing threats of homeless, as well as doing some volunteer work with um, Homeline answering tenant questions. So just a, some thoughts as the whole morning progressed. On the emergency funds, I'm glad to hear that there's thought about how do we have some emergency funds to help tenants who have that one time when they can't make their rent payment. As a volunteer at Homeline, I hear that it's for many, it's more systemic. The housing itself is not affordable and it's just gonna keep multiplying. So it's money, money, money. We need more affordable units. In terms of this, this emergency pay, fund payment, I'd suggest tying it with the tenant being able to repay whatever the debt is over a long period of time, tacking it on to rent, maybe taking out a security deposit at the end, allowing the tenant to make their rent payments as their income comes in, um, rather than paying it monthly, maybe paying it every two weeks when the paycheck comes through. I liked, I'm glad to see number nine about the alternative styles of housing. Um, I hope we come up with something better than granny flats. Um, you've, I've seen in the newspaper the last few days, things like rent, by the bedroom or co-living, and these things are being tried in New York and Chicago and Miami, and the idea is we're gonna cut down the number of kitchens we have to build, which is a big expense, by allowing people to just rent a bedroom with a, a bathroom that's their own and then have um, a common kitchen. So that's an interesting thing too. And then finally to um, address Lael's question about tools to preserve um, housing that could be uh, the NOAA housing. Um, and it's an idea I've been playing with. I know others have been too, and I haven't quite figured out all the ramifications, but there's a concept called an option to buy, whereas I see a piece of property I would like to get, I'll enter into an option to buy with that owner of the property. So when the owner of the property is ready to sell or I'm ready to actually acquire it, then I've got the first right. Um, there's some, obviously the option is going to cost money, so what could be used in order to get a NOAA property willing to enter into this option to buy? And then you pair it with a right of first refusal so that when it comes time to buy that NOAA, if they can't reach a, a price that works for them, um, let the person go, let the owner go on the market and if the uh, offer on the free market comes within a certain percentage of what my last offer was to buy the property, then I get that right of first refusal. Again, just kind of a bare bones idea. Play around with it. Elizabeth Glidden. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Glidden. I am the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Policy for the Minnesota Housing Partnership. Um, 
as we were looking across the initial draft recommendations from all three of the subcommittees, one thing seems very clear, which is that the state needs to increase its investment in how it supports housing for all Minnesotans. It is not the sexy thing, but it is the real thing. And uh, the more that this task force is able to lift that up in a format of a recommendation that advocacy groups and other partners can take forward into the next legislature and for the next administration, I think will be very important. Um, I'm just passing around a little handout, which kind of repeats what you all know, but it is a, a request that you put into your top tier of recommendations a dedicated source of funding. Bonding is nice, but it has been unreliable, and we need more than the funds that are now committed to Minnesota housing. Uh, we also would suggest that um, this task force might direct staff to do as much as possible to prepare this recommendation to be closer to vetted and ready to move forward, including asking staff to review and analyze potential sources for a dedicated revenue source. Thank you. This is uh, not exactly what we do for public comment, so excuse me for bending the rules a little bit, but Ms. Glidden, I believe your organization also has a tax credit proposal that is alive in the Senate, and would you like to bring us up to date on that? Yes, so um, it, is, it is alive in the Senate. It is uh, for a tax credit contribution fund. We think that this is uh, one of the uh, most important creative new ideas that is out there that will allow uh, private uh, individuals and organizations, uh, businesses to help invest in creating housing that fits the needs of their community, affordable housing. Uh, right now, it is uh, in the tax omnibus bill as a study. Uh, this was an amendment that was agreed to, uh, and so we are hopeful that within the conference committee, this could perhaps go back to the original proposal, which is to put the policy into the tax omnibus bill with a very small amount of money, say a million dollars. We think that's what might be reasonable uh, for this session to make it uh, ready for the 2019 legislative session to become a, a, a vehicle uh, to properly fund and allow that investment to start taking place. So it happens that the person who um, carried the bill in the Senate and got the floor amendment was my Senator, uh, Senator Nelson. And it happens that uh, Representative Greg Davids from my part of the state is the chair of the House Tax Committee. Um, I spoke with Senator uh, Nelson about this on Saturday. She believes that if, the, if there is broad support for this provision in the tax bill, there is still time to get this to happen. Um, we discussed uh, the need to get the business community to weigh in, and I spoke briefly with Brad uh, before the meeting started about perhaps the Itasca group could help support this. Spoke briefly with Akua about could, uh, could uh, her former employer or other, uh, or I didn't get a chance to speak with May Kyle. Can we get, I don't know if Wilder takes positions on bills, but this is, this is a really golden opportunity for this task force. I know we don't have a way to get the full task force to support taking some action, but um, members of the task force as individuals really could do that. Uh, I have been, I think I've been within the parameters of my, my charge with you. Um, so in our part of the state, uh, the Rochester Area Foundation will be contacting our business community and asking them to contact Representative Davids. But if, the, if anyone has direct contacts with any of the tax committee conferees that will be helpful, but also very important right now, according to Senator Nelson, would be to get uh, communication into the governor's office that indicates that members of this task force think this is a good thing for him to do um, and uh, that he would hopefully support an, uh, some kind of, a, if there's some compromise that comes out of conference committee or the way it works in the legislature, if the governor's staff could indicate he'd like to see that. Um, there, we sort of like, if we pursue all the avenues, uh, maybe there's a chance that this, we can come out of this legislative session with uh, something specific that will help incentivize private investment into housing. So um, I've, all, I've lobbied all of you now. I'm looking for great action. Um, so it, it is a chance that we can make some difference here. Uh, Commissioner. Yes, I just wanted to comment uh, one question that might run through your mind is, you know, why wasn't, 
why wasn't this put forward in the governor's tax bill? And I would say that um, it, this idea has been kicking around for a while. Um, we have worked with MHP to uh, give some fairly substantive input to the operational um, parts of this so that should it pass, um, it would pass in a way that would be relatively easy to implement. Um, but it gained momentum kind of very late in the game. And so there just simply was not time to have the dialogue with the governor's office before he put his tax bill out there. So I, I just, if there were questions in your mind of, you know, are, are there concerns? Is this something coming out of left field? Um, we've been involved on an operational level, but that's why we did not bring it forward last fall. Okay. So um, may I turn this to Merritt or Kathy? Anything we need to do here? All right. We're at the end of our meeting and looking ahead at a few things that are going to be happening. There is a joint working session that uh, members of the work group, this work group and the rental work group are invited to participate in this coming Friday from 1 to 2.30 to talk about uh, kind of overlap issues. And Jessica or Kathy, I don't know if you want to say a little more about that. Okay, so I know you don't know about this because this just came to fruition late Friday night. So I'll send out an email inviting folks um, what, what the topics that we want to cover. And so we, we've made this optional because obviously it's this week. Uh, they they want to talk about the overlap on housing conditions and the impact on tenant rent control, tenant notifications, which we've talked about a lot, rental subsidies, NOAA. So all of these conversations that both work groups are having, we just want to get together um, and make sure we're on the same page of, of how we're recommending things from each of our work groups. So I'll send that out as soon as I'm done with this meeting. Yep. So hot off the press right here on the slide. Yeah, the, the co-chairs had a, had a conference call on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock. So staff had no opportunity to let you know about this came out of that meeting. And then our next task force meeting is the Tuesday after Memorial Day. We'll be back at Wilder and um, hence the house with a U.S. flag on it. And then the next work group meeting for you guys will be um, same time and place on Monday, June 4th. And this will be your last meeting together as a work group. And then we will have the last task force meeting at the end of June. So that's what we have coming up. Lots of great work in a short timeline. I think the staff are looking at each other at this end of the table going, just one more. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the great staff work that we've had. There are two more. Oh, yeah. There are two more regional forums. One is on the 10th uh, in St. Paul, on the St. Paul campus, and on the 15th in Sleepy Eye. Thank you. Well, everyone, enjoy this beautiful summer day. <laughs> we skipped spring right to summer. So uh, enjoy the day, and we'll see you, some of you Friday and the rest of you in a month. Bye-bye.